Hello everyone! In this video, we will be sharing a manhwa titled I Tamed My Husband's Mad Dog, Parts 1 through 5. Please put a like and subscribe to the channel if you like our videos. It really helps us a lot. Okay, here we go! At a distant childhood, her father had promised his daughter, whom he called his favorite apple pie, to make her the first lady of the country. But now she, Reinhardt Rink, growing up on the estate of the Marquis of Rinke, sat over a coffin. The coffin of her father who had passed away 15 years ago. Before the girl realized what was going on, a painfully familiar voice sounded behind her. The crown prince, Michel Alankis, towered over her and was displeased with his wife's behavior. A wife with whom he was going to dissolve his marriage very soon, stripping her of her status as crown princess. Reinhardt knew what he was about to say. Michelle wanted a divorce. And in response, the girl herself would be outraged. Should the crown prince speak such words before the coffin of her father, who died in his place because of the order? The father, the Marquis of Rink, kept his word then. He had given his daughter the most important title in the Alanki's empire through a marriage of convenience. Thanks to him, after an engagement at the age of 12, Reinhardt became a crown princess and called the wife of Michelle Alanx. Of course, as is usually the case in marriages of convenience, between her and her husband there were no feelings. And the crown prince quickly found himself a mistress, Dulcinea Canaria, princess of the Principality of Canaria, taken hostage. She had the nerve to whisper orders favorable to the crown prince, such as stopping the importation of Sarawak Desert salt in favor of the girl's home principality. And Michelle was letting her do it. The crown prince, firmly in love with Dulcinea, began an absurd tyranny and reaped the fruits of his deeds. Sarawak, dissatisfied with the monopoly contract mutinied, his Majesty the Emperor's orders were that His Highness the Crown Prince should deal with it personally. Michel then summoned the Marquis of Rink, on whom he hoped to entrust the duty of leading an army to suppress the mutiny in his stead. His wife's father was a retired general, and though he was willing to do the Crown Prince's bidding, he had a condition. For the Marquis to lead the army into battle, he demanded to put an end to the relationship with the Princess of Canaria. So. Having gone to war for his daughter's welfare, the old general returned a cold body in a coffin. And now the crown prince, responsible for the death of his wife's father, was pondering how much compensation Reinhardt Reink deserved for her parents' valor. In the end, he reasoned that a million Alankers and the lands of Helk would suffice. The lands of Helk were the most fertile territory in the empire, vast holdings with endless possibilities, and as the deposed Princess Reinhardt should be grateful for such rich and fertile lands. However, that was not what she desired. Much more Reinhardt would settle for a life for a life. The life of the Princess of Canaria, for the life of the Princess of Canaria, for the life of her father, who by and large had died because of this person's demand. Therefore, Reinhardt's anger would be dispelled if the Crown Prince would at least chop off her hand. The Crown Princess was not going to just accept this situation. Naturally, the Crown Prince started to refuse and called such an act cruel. Well, well Reinhardt will be satisfied with Michael Alanki's head. She would be satisfied if she chopped it off and gave it to the dogs. Shocked by such a bold statement, the Crown Prince forcefully pushed his wife away from him, calling her crazy. The Crown Prince was going to get out of the estate and in the near future he planned to send from the imperial palace of the official confirmation of the dissolution of the dissolution of the marriage. A sleeping wife he did not consider worthy of a choice in the matter. Reinhardt remembered how for 15 years she had been dying in Helka, the land of opportunity. The girl had begged countless times for a chance to go back in time, to give her just one chance. One chance to kill Michelle Alankis. Time after time she had prayed and dared. And right now, that chance was at arm's length. The manor was filled with the scream of pain of the prince, who had been stabbed through the calf by his consort's sword. He howled, calling for the cardinal, and Reinhardt drew her sword for the next blow. She decided to finally put her good name aside improperly. 
Go crazy. Yes, Reinhardt Renke had traveled back in time into her grieving self of 15 years ago, who would be abandoned by Michel on this day. Two months later, Reinhardt Delphine Reinke was on trial for attempted murder of the crown prince. She was stripped of her title as crown princess, and the Rank family forfeited all their rights. Also, the lands, property, and servants of the Marquis of Rinke went into the possession of Michelle Alenkis. The condemned girl herself was not upset. She had only recently realized that she had actually gone back 15 years to her downcast self and done what she wished. Wiped Michael's foot to powder. Now the crown prince would definitely not be able to practice his favorite dances. So at the trial, instead of sadness on the face of the former crown princess, shown a sincere smile. Seeing this, Michelle wanted to demand her father to punish her right now, but the emperor besieged his son. Because of the situation with Princess Canaria, the trust of the imperial family had already been shaken, and on top of that, the whole country was grieving after the death of Marquis Rank, and this oaf was about to announce a divorce. The crown prince should be thankful that he stayed in his place. Reinhardt Rinke was banished to Rudin of the Fielden family, the only land the girl had left. They wanted her to die of cold. Rudin belonged to Reinhardt's mother. It was a desolate and miserable place, very different from the Helk lands she'd gotten in her previous life, and it snowed there six months of the year. If that's not Reinhardt's wish to die in the streets, what is? The court, meanwhile, required the criminal to express her gratitude to His Majesty the Emperor until death and to repent of her crime by being born again, and being born again, and being born again, and dying again, until the dragon soared over the frame mountain range. In that moment, the girl resolved to survive to the very end in the lands to which she had been banished, and curse Alankis. Reinhardt had to travel to Rudin's lands on her own. She did so in the company of a mercenary hired by Johanna, who was the crown princess's maid, Rink had thought that he had somehow easily agreed to go with her despite the long journey, and her suspicions were justified. Two-thirds of the way down the road, the man became stubborn, and the former crown princess made the decision to let him go on his own. However, the bastard demanded to give up everything she had, especially the sword on the girl's belt. It was the sword of the Rinky family, and it was unacceptable to give it to such a rabble, but... The mercenary threatened swift retribution. Reinhardt gritted her teeth, but realized that survival was paramount. Did she have the right to waste her father's hard-earned life? So the girl threw all her money and sword on the snow and told the mercenary to get away. But the man grabbed her by the shoulder. All the savings and the expensive sword were not enough for him. He also wanted the body of the former crown princess. But Reinhardt spat in his face and ordered him to disappear. The man became enraged slapped the girl and started pulling her hair, saying that she was nothing. He was going to take her by force, but before that he was going to torture her, causing physical injuries. But then the mercenary suddenly fell to his knees, grunting pitifully and covering his head with his hands. He was in pain, but why? What did it matter, though? This was Rinky's only chance to eliminate the threat, whatever it was. She brought her sword over the man and thrust it into his body. When the mercenary fell silent, the girl realized she had succeeded. She leaned back tiredly. Her gaze fell on the bloody fruit that had apparently hit the man in the back of the head, causing him to fall. A rustling sound came from the direction of the bushes. Someone was hiding there. Reinhardt held her sword out in front of her and demanded the man hiding there to come out. And when her order was followed, she was surprised. There was a boy standing by the bushes. Out of the bushes came a small, disheveled child, whom Reinhardt had mistaken for a demonic beast a few seconds ago. It bothered her to find a small boy in this wilderness. The worst reason came to mind, the barbarians living on the northern ridge. Her father had once told the girl that they lured people with small children and used them for food during the winter. Reinhardt decided to see if the child would attack her and held her sword out in front of her, threatening to slaughter him if he came any closer. The boy suddenly perked up and rushed towards her, despite the girl's warning shouts. Eventually, Reinhardt swung her sword and the child caught it with his hand by the blade. Blood flowed, but the child didn't even move. He pressed down on the blade, forcibly lowering it and reached for the girl's hand. Reinhardt already thought that she was going to be eaten, 
But the boy began to lick the woman's fingers, or rather the wound between them. She had appeared when Rink had aimed her sword at the mercenary in a hurry and killed him. The girl hadn't even noticed, and the child had done it all to heal the wound. Then Reinhardt asked him if he had thrown the fruit that had smashed the man's head. The child shook his head. Hey, hadn't meant to hurt the girl, and she was genuinely grateful for the help. But the boy didn't react in any way, prompting the thought that he didn't understand speech. So it was best to heal his wound on his arm first. Reinhardt pulled the now blood-stained bandages from under the corpse and cursed. The mercenary was a nuisance even after death. The boy suddenly responded to the curse with a jerky sound. When Reinhardt had killed the mercenary, she had swore too. Does this child really think swearing is a proper name? Rink reached out to ruffle her little savior's hair, but he recoiled and covered himself with his arms as if preparing for a blow. It looked like he had been abused while growing up, and now he was trembling and mumbling a weak, no, poor thing. Reinhardt calmed him down by telling him she wouldn't hit him, thanked him again, and stroked his head after all. Rink bandaged the boy's arm after all, and while he looked at the bandages, she looked at the map, trying to determine the direction Rudin was in. The blood-stained map wasn't very clear, but it was something. When the girl had already picked a direction, the child ran out in front of her with an emphatic, No! Rinky suppressed the suspicion in herself that the little savior could still lead her to the barbarians. She decided to believe and listen. When asked which way to go, the boy mumbled no incessantly and then rushed forward with the same exclamation. Reinhardt followed him. In this way, they walked for about two hours and reached a place from which Rudin was perfectly visible. The way was much shorter than if they had followed the map. How did the boy know the way? In any case, it was deep night, so Reinhardt found a suitable cave where they could wait until tomorrow. It was snowing, after all, and going down the mountain with nothing to see ahead was a bad idea. In the cave, Rinky built a fire with flint stones. The boy was mesmerized by the fire, and when he was given the stones, he enthusiastically began trying to make sparks. When asked if he was having fun, he again answered no. This was the answer the child gave to all questions, and apparently it was the only one he knew how to pronounce. Reinhardt thought that if she were to take the boy to Rudin, she would have to teach him to talk first. Where did the child come from in those mountains? And what was he doing there? When they reached the fortress, the boy suddenly threw a tantrum and tried to run away. That was how much he disliked the settlements. Reinhardt, even though she didn't know what the child was doing, realized that he didn't have a normal guardian. She had to think of a way to calm the little companion down. Rinka saw a man coming out of the fortress gate with bread. Reinhardt bought a couple of loaves and looked at the boy. He looked at the food with all his eyes and drooled at the mere sight of it. The girl gave him all the two loaves and watched the boy eating them with a smile. She explained that if the boy went with her to the fortress, she would give him more bread. He made the right choice and took the girl by the hand. Together, they went to the guardhouse, where Reinhardt introduced herself as Lord Rudena. She was taken to an audience with Sarah, the woman who had long been in charge of Rudena's administration of the field and family. It was the first time in 20 years that a lord, Reinhardt, had come to this fortress in person. Jeopardy! Helka and Rudin were very different. Lord Helka's castle was 10 times the size of the one in Rudin, but Lord Rudin's castle looks like it's 300 years old. In addition, it snows six months of the year, and there's a constant shortage of food. There are only 30 soldiers to defend the vast lands as well. Although there were no wars with other lands, who would invade such a territory? Reinhardt never dreamed that the lands of the Fielden family, her mother's family, would be in such a state. Rinky asked Sarah for the working records of her cousin, the previous lord. However, it turned out that the previous lord was born and raised in the large city of Belcane, so he did his work through a deputy. While he was alive, he had only visited Rudin three times. In other words, Sarah didn't want some lord who wasn't local to get involved. But Reinhardt couldn't do that. Michelle, the bastard, was still alive. 
and his former consort hadn't started her revenge for real yet. Rinky directly stated that, for Sarah, the crown princess, who was probably kicked out of the capital for committing a crime, was probably too troublesome a lord. Sarah evasively remarked that she didn't say that. And since she had, Reinhardt had asked for advice on how to manage these lands. She was going to revitalize Rudin. So the first thing Rinky asked was to take care of the boy that saved her and to tell her if anyone found out about the child's origins. But as soon as the maid tried to take the boy away to wash, he broke free and ran away. The servants rushed in pursuit. Reinhardt laughed, finding the sight amusing. But soon the smile faded from the new Lord Rudin's face. Sarah reported that the local butler recognized the child immediately. He came from the family of Holland, who had fallen because of the barbarian attack. Rinko was clearly shocked. Holona! Could it really be Michael Alanquez's mad dog Will Holona? Will Holona! A man who once appeared and became the hero of Alanki's war. It was known that he was blood-related to the barbarians, but Reinhardt knew his true origins. He wasn't just some half-breed barbarian. He was the Emperor's bastard. Seventeen years ago, while the Emperor was traveling to inspect the Northern Lands, a lady of the Holland family, a small aristocratic family from the North, got pregnant. The Empress, who found out, had a hand in the child's disappearance. She ordered that the entire Holland clan be burned and that no one be left alive. The Holland clan, falsely accused of treason, was destroyed. Animals, children, even women in labor were no exception. Everyone thought Will Holona was dead. But the year Michelle Alanx turned 34, the year it had been 10 years since his divorce from Reinhardt, Michel brought him in. He fought like he'd die if he didn't kill someone. He won on every battlefield. He took over vast territories for his master and earned the nickname Mad Dog due to his incredible loyalty. All these accomplishments became the property of his master, Michel, and the insufferable crown prince, Michel Alanquis, was enthroned as the beloved emperor. Every time the subjects raged and shouted the crown prince's name, it was to Will Holland's credit. Will Holona that cursed man. Reinhardt had been sure then that she would succeed in the rebellion exactly until she met Will Holona, who had come to the Helklands where war was being prepared. It was as if he had been expecting it. And despite Reinhardt possessing Helk's vast army and a river of wealth pouring down, she wasn't sure she could stand up to the man. Will you Halone? Now, however, a smaller version of this man sat in front of her, apparently. Reinhardt had to wash and dry the child herself because he would not let anyone but her do it. The servants were dismissed by the Lord as unnecessary. When they left, Rink looked again at the now clean and very cute baby. Holland's villa. Involuntarily, her palms clenched into fists and she grinned wickedly. But immediately she changed her tone to a friendly one and offered the boy something to eat. He rushed toward the dining hall with a joyous cry of bread. As he ran away, Reinhardt covered her face with her palms. If that child is really Will Halona, if Will Halona is on her side this time, she might actually succeed in getting revenge. The thought made Rinksy's eyes brim with tears of happiness. Had her father really given his daughter a new life to give Will Holland in it? There was a knock at the door and the girl hurriedly wiped away her tears. A boy looked out from behind the door he brought her bread and put it in her hands. Reinhardt was still trying to realize that in this life, Will Holona would be at her side, would grow up obeying the deposed crown princess, would become her knight. And this time, there was no way Michelle Alanquis would ever get her hands on this child, to whom Reinhardt Reinke had now given the name Wilhelm. Wilhelm continued to let no one near him but Reinhardt who was now braiding his hair and marveling that this child was 16 years old. And while she was doing that, she was discussing Thanksgiving with Sarah. Food and goods were distributed to the villagers, for winter was merciless in Rudin. If the Lord didn't distribute food, the villagers would starve to death. Salt, flour, dried beans. Flour was especially expensive and Reinhardt came up with the idea that they could grow corn on the land and make flour from it and then distribute it. 
Sarah agreed that the idea could be a success, but there were simply not enough hands in Rudine to do the work. There is a very small population in this land, and if you counted all the young men here, you wouldn't have a hundred. They may have had a fat turkey in the capital on Thanksgiving, but it's impossible to find one in Rudin. Wild goose at most, which the captain of the garrison hunted, and no one will come to the dinner party. Reinhardt, having heard all this, let Sarah go. She was convinced that Rudin was disgustingly poor land. They were too different from the Helka lands that Renke had gotten in her previous life. There, there were 3,000 soldiers. Every year they changed hundreds of carpets and blades. And here, for example, here this year, the guards were given one sack of dried apples as a reward. Reinhardt couldn't help but swear. Wilhelm immediately turned his head, responding. The girl hurriedly explained that she was not addressing him now. Rinky had intended not to swear in front of the boy, but sometimes it came out of her own mouth with the current situation. She apologized for her behavior, and Wilhelm blushed like a poppy, muttering a quiet no. Reinhardt decided to check his homework, but on the sheet was written cornmeal. Soldiers, turkey. The words from her conversation with Sarah. Rink even laughed, suggesting that the pupil become her secretary. Wilhelm, on the other hand, rested on the girl's lap with his cheeks turning pink. He blushed even more when she patted him on the head again. It was incredibly hard to find a teacher for the boy in Rudin, mostly due to the fact that there are generally few qualified people in these lands, but also because rumors like this started to spread. The new lord went mad after losing her father. As a result, she was banished for attacking the crown prince. So Reinhardt will have to teach Wilhelm herself. Fortunately, he is a smart child, but unfortunately, the girl could not teach him everything on her own. For example, Rudena didn't have a decent swordsmanship teacher, and Rink wasn't a warrior. At the same time, in his previous life, Michelle had quickly found him a teacher. He knew that Wilhelm was the emperor's bastard. Since Reinhardt herself had gotten this information from the Crown Prince's crony, it was accurate. But how did Michelle know about Wilhelm's origins to take it upon himself to raise him? If even the inconsiderate Crown Prince realized, then the method should be simple. For example, the ring on the boy's index finger could have belonged to the Imperial family. Rinka was pulled out of her musings by Wilhelm, who had finished his task. The girl praised him and habitually reached out to stroke his shaggy head, but the boy suddenly approached her and literally rubbed his forehead against her lips. Then flushed, he ran out of the room, leaving Reinhardt confused. When she realized what had happened, she laughed uproariously. On Thanksgiving morning, Knight Dietrich arrived in Rudin and got down on one knee before the former crown princess. He apologized for learning too late about what had happened, but as soon as he heard that his highness had left the capital alone, he immediately went to Rudin. Reinhardt could not hold back her tears. She was grateful simply for Dietrich just coming here. But the man shook his head. Still, he could not do otherwise, for he and the girl were on intimate terms. Dietrich had the imprudence to say this in the presence of Wilhelm, who stared gloomily at the stranger with evident hostility. Dietrich Ernst is the childhood friend with whom Reinhardt used to have fun before and one of the knights her father trusted the most. For a while, he had even been Lady Rank's fleeting first love. Now, he appeared in Rudin to the deposed crown princess and shared his impressions of this cold and depleted land as if nothing had happened. He even joked that when he passed the last mountain, he had wandered in search of his highness for fear of finding her covered in snow. Reinhardt, who had briefly sent Wilhelm out of the room, asked him not to call her your highness anymore, since she was deprived of that title. Dietrich then decided to address her as Viscountess. The conversation about Rudin's unenviable state continued, and the girl sprang out of her own mouth about the times when she had ruled Helka. Dietrich could not know about that, of course, so Rinky quickly corrected herself, referring to a simple caveat. Then the knight inquired about the Viscountess's plans for the future, and regretted that the crown prince had lost her. This surprised Reinhardt. If Dietrich had shown up a year ago, 
she would have thought he had simply come to inquire about the well-being of an old acquaintance. But Dietrich had arrived three or four months after the crown princess had been deposed. He came to meet her, who had arrived in Rudin only recently. Now that the crown prince has not yet recovered from the shock of being wounded, and all the lords of the empire are closing in on the emperor to please him, that Dietrich came alone to Rudin at a time like this. He was either cast out of the family or he left on his own. Reinhardt put the question squarely. The knight evasively answered that if anything to choose, it was the second. The girl understood it this way. Dietrich had so often said he would leave the family and his older brother had taken to kicking him out. The man chuckling agreed. But after a moment, the smile slipped from his lips and he shared his worries about Michael Alonkis. He was trying to take full possession of Rinky's lands. Since the vice countess had just been declared an outlaw, the crown prince began to greedily try to seize all of the Marquis of Rink's property. And not only lands, but also knights. Because above all, the main wealth of Rinky was his knights. Dietrich simply could not watch as a man who could not even walk properly, ruled the knights. Therefore, the knight blushed with an understatement. He had come to swear allegiance to the Viscountess. Reinhardt laughed that in Rudin Knights in Rudin as a gift for New Year's Eve, give Badian, and she simply had nothing to give him. And what would someone like Dietrich do in these lands? Rudena even has only 30 soldiers. Ernst said with an important look that he would have to become the leader in that case. Reinhardt looked at his back thoughtfully. Is he obligated to rot here, however? There might be one worthy occupation for him. The girl thought of Wilhelm. Dietrich would be a perfect match for his swordsmanship teacher. Rinky voiced this suggestion to Dietrich and took her to show him Wilhelm again. The man joked that he should get more than one sack of wheat for the role of teacher, but Reinhardt could only add a wild goose dinner on top. Chuckling, they headed for the dining hall, where they found Wilhelm. The boy clearly didn't like the sight of Reinhardt being led under the arm by Dietrich, and he was scowling and sullen. Reinhardt introduced Wilhelm as the child who had saved her life and invited Dietrich to sit down at the table next to him. But when the man tried to say hello to the boy, he suddenly jumped up and ran out of the room. He glared at the knight with a frown, peering out from behind the door. Reinhardt tried to persuade Wilhelm to return to the table, but he would not listen to her. Dietrich offered to bring the boy, but the girl decided to act in her own way. She began to eat very enthusiastically, saying that the food is very enthusiastically, saying that the food is very tasty. Rinky thought it was easier to interest a fractious child. Dietrich was not too sure about such a method, but still played along with the Viscountess. Seeing the knight pouring sauce over the food while helping Reinhardt, Wilhelm fled to his room, leaving the adults confused. Dietrich again offered to bring the boy back, but the girl refused. She thought that even if Wilhelm starved for a couple of days, it would clear his mind and they should continue the meal now. After all, this could be their last dinner party of the year. It had been three days since Wilhelm had crammed himself into his room and never left it, not even for meals. Reinhardt didn't understand why the boy was acting this way and it made her very angry. She even turned to Dietrich, asking what exactly could be threatened at such an age so that the teenager would finally get the bad ideas of hunger strike out of his head. The knight inquired about the child's age, and when he found out that Wilhelm was 16, he swore hard, for which he was immediately reprimanded by his mistress. Dietrich was simply amazed. Wilhelm was 16, and it wasn't even he was frail and puny, as Reinhardt thought. Knights who look like a languid horse aren't one or two either. The man simply thought it absurd that a man who does more primitive things than a newly born foal was already 16 years old. When Dietrich himself had turned that age, he had gone to war, following the Marquis of Rank, and had served him. He was his escort, and this one. The Viscountess seemed to think that since Wilhelm was the size of a kitten, he was a small child to be cuddled and coddled. But that was not the case. Dietrich asked to leave it to him and throwing aside the blanket, grabbed Wilhelm by the ankle. The man yanked his body upward with surprising ease and began to reprimand the teenager. Would this kid, behaving like this, be able to become a man to match the name Reinhardt had given him? 
The knight threw him off the bed, and Anne, ignoring the Viscountess's indignation, continued. He unexpectedly stated that, already at the age of 18, Reinhardt had proposed marriage to him. Embarrassed by such words, the girl tried to silence him, and while they fiddled, Wilhelm sat down on the bed. Dietrich had expected this. He realized from the boy's actions that he could work with his head, but even though Wilhelm looked like a child, boys of 16 are crafty. The knight pressed the sore point, asking the teenager if he would continue to hide and just watch Reinhardt like this, even at 18. Wilhelm's gaze began to seem angry and the firm no he had uttered now clearly made sense. When they were very young, Reinhardt climbed up a tree to pick apricots for jam. Suddenly she stumbled and flew down, but Dietrich caught her. Yes, there was a time. Now the knight was dragging Wilhelm away by the scruff of his neck. Behind them was Reinhardt, who did not understand. In her humble opinion, the outrageous actions of her friend but Dietrich asked not to interfere, for, as he said, men have their own way of communicating with each other. The girl, however, continued to be indignant. Is it possible to grab a small child like that? The knight turned around and asked her ingratiatingly whether in that case he should go back to Ernst. Since you can't do that, Reinhardt couldn't find an answer. Wilhelm needed this training. She had no right to deprive him of it. So the girl apologized to the teenager and, kissing his forehead, promised that Dietrich would be a good teacher. Wilhelm only needs to obey the knight and become a terrific person. This clearly had a very strong effect on the boy, and he, blushing, became quiet. But Dietrich suddenly pulled him back and jokingly remarked that the kiss was not deserved, and it was better for the Viscountess to appreciate the teacher instead of the student. Reinhardt parried that the knight was already a terrific man, and such a compliment the man was satisfied. The Viscountess, staunchly bitching at Dietrich's frivolity, chastised him for treating Wilhelm well. The knight smiled and kissed her hand in agreement, much to the teenager's dismay. Wilhelm's frowning face made Dietrich laugh and taking the boy under his arm, he headed away. Reinhardt escorted him with a perplexed look. Outside, Dietrich tossed Wilhelm onto the damp ground. The expression on the elder's face lost all friendliness. He didn't like children who couldn't think straight, and the Viscountess might have kissed a child like Wilhelm, but the man wouldn't. In the past, the subleader Reinhard Dietrich had done nothing but chase bastards like this teenager off the land every day. Wilhelm's eyes showed that he understood the speech. The boy had saved the Viscountess's life without even knowing how to speak. In Dietrich's opinion, Wilhelm should consider it an honor that someone like him was able to save her life, and the knight would make him worthy of that honor because that is what the Viscountess desires. Dietrich tossed Wilhelm a wooden sword and ordered him to get up and move quickly, quickly. The boy growled stubbornly and jumped to his feet, clutching the hilt in his hands. Dietrich continued to stare at him coldly. The knight had come to Rudin, hoping to persuade Reinhardt to leave these bloody cold lands in the empire, but it seemed the day was far off when they would abandon the empire. A few days later, a crowd of townsfolk marveled at how neatly Dietrich had cut the neck of a pig. People were clearly happy to socialize with him. Reinhardt could only marvel at Dietrich's ability to find common ground with those around him. And this, despite the fact that people still avoided the Lord who was here for two months. From the other end, the girl was timidly called out to Wilhelm by name, pronouncing the name in syllables, Rain, Hard. His hair at this point had already been sloppily trimmed by Dietrich. The sight caused Rinky to laugh heartily, and she beckoned the teenager closer to trim his hair. Dietrich was of the opinion that Wilhelm had to be beaten like a cornered mouse to make him human, for he could neither speak nor swing a sword, and this at the age of 16. Reinhardt, of course, thought that this was just an excuse for harsh treatment and was against it. But, surprisingly, the knight's methods were effective and Wilhelm began to speak much more than when he was taught by the girl. And now Reinhardt was about to trim the boy's hair and asked him to sit still. It was the girl's first time cutting hair and, well, it showed. She cut it so short that Dietrich, who saw it, immediately burst out laughing and began to tease her pupil. The Viscountess gave the knight a stern look 
and he calmed down, slapping Wilhelm's forehead. Dietrich was also distracted from the boy's torment by the food on the table, potatoes and corn porridge. It had been served more than once or twice, but at this time of year, even such food was a feast for Rudin. The knight reported William's need to eat more meat to get stronger. Reinhardt could not deny the reasonableness of those words. She concluded after a little thought that it was possible to serve the boy the meat that had been left for her. Dietrich was adamantly opposed to this arrangement. The cold outside the window was fierce, and the girl needed proper nourishment and rest. When Reinhardt said that she was not cold, he advised her to take off her cloak and not to sulk at her old friend's words. Wilhelm, who had observed such familiarity in the Lord's direction, frowned unhappily. Dietrich, as if nothing had happened, leaned back in his chair and voiced his intention to go on a winter hunt soon, and to take Wilhelm with him. Reinhardt was against it, still considering the boy a child. He could not, in her opinion, do something like hunting. Wilhelm himself was clearly taken aback by this statement. Even he didn't consider himself that small. And though Reinhardt was against the idea, she realized that in their situation, with not enough guards to even guard the castle, there was really no other way. All the Vice Countess could do was ask Dietrich not to die by falling on the antlers of a reindeer. Toward evening, Wilhelm drilled his toothbrush with a thoughtful look. Dietrich had previously intimated to him that if he didn't brush his teeth, he would be ahead in the reindeer hunt tomorrow. The suddenly approaching Reinhardt acted more subtly. She shared her terrible aversion to brushing her teeth that she had experienced as a child. But her father had told her that if she did it badly, the prince would run away when he came to take the girl away. Then she did not yet know what she would do in the future with Michael's leg. Wilhelm distracted her from her thoughts by timidly asking if she didn't like that sort of thing either. Reinhardt smiled and said that she really disliked guys who didn't brush their teeth. The pupil immediately began brushing vigorously in her mouth. Dietrich had repeatedly told the Viscountess not to treat a 16-year-old boy like a 6-year-old, but Wilhelm looked so cute. The girl couldn't treat him like an adult. After Wilhelm had brushed his teeth, Reinhardt checked the quality of the brushing and praised the boy, who looked embarrassed and looked down. In the evening, Reinhardt told Wilhelm a legend while Dietrich was busy with his bow for the future hunt. The contents of the legend were as follows. Halsey, the goddess of vengeance, hated reindeer more than anything else in the world. Alutica, the god of tranquility and fertility. The god of tranquility and fertility thwarted her deeds with the help of the reindeer that drove Halsey's chariot. On the horns of these animals grew a world tree. The taste of the fruit of this tree was Halsey's favorite flavor. So she, even knowing that Alutica was hindering her, did not harm the reindeer. Each time she ate the fruit, Halsey fell asleep on their backs. It was only when Halsey fell asleep that the weather became calm. Alutica, taking her asleep on the back of her own reindeer throughout the continent, brought fertility and tranquility. That is why, when it suddenly gets warm in winter, everyone says, Alutica put Halsey to sleep. But when the warm days pass, a blizzard of incredible force is sure to come because of Halsey's anger. Dietrich frowned. He had warned Reinhardt that this was not a fairy tale for children's ears. The girl did not quite understand why, for it was told by the father of his daughter. But apparently, Marquis Rank did not tell the whole tale for his daughter's peace of mind. Dietrich enlightened the Viscountess by telling the missing pieces of the story. After the bitter cold, spring always comes. And the reason for the appearance is that the goddess of spring, Anilak, was born from the belly of Halsey. Hence, what did Alutika and Halsey, who slept 21 nights, do to bear a child? Reinhardt, realizing, immediately flared up and untimely covered Wilhelm's ears. It was too late. Dietrich laughed merrily. When Wilhelm fell asleep in Reinhardt's lap, Dietrich finally asked the question that had been tormenting him. Did this boy remind her of her father? The knight had a very clear memory of Marquis Rink bringing a four-year-old girl from the road. Dietrich had been six and was only the second son of a common vassal, but he had been treated by the Marquis as he had been treated by Reinhardt. 
Now the man understood why he did so. The Marquis was trying to pull people in the family to his side and at the same time make Dietrich a partner for the games of a peer. Therefore, Ernst could not help but know why the Viscountess holds this child's hand, kisses his forehead, tells stories while sitting by the fire. He knew where these actions originated. Dietrich asked her to forget, if she could, that she treasured Wilhelm and loved him. Reinhardt threw a glance in the direction of the sleeping boy. Will Holland. That she was doting on this child and pretending to forget her father was true, but the girl couldn't forget the reason she had sheltered Will Hallona. So to Dietrich, she answered directly. If she had only been able to forget it from hurting the crown prince's leg, she would have forgotten it long ago. Dietrich understood her and hummed. He praised Reinhardt for her shrewdness. Or was it luck for Wilhelm? The black venomous snake in the Viscountess's arms had broken at least five wooden swords in the past week. Reinhardt was taken aback, then laughed. The knight woke the child, intending to send him to his private room to sleep. The teenager called the man Diedrich, and he complained again about his mispronunciation. Reinhardt, realizing that Wilhelm had difficulty pronouncing their names, set a condition. If Wilhelm went hunting successfully, she would allow him to call her reign. The next day, Dietrich and Wilhelm and five soldiers went hunting. Within a week, they had caught a huge reindeer. The reindeer's head was said to have been cut off by Wilhelm. In the winter of that year, heavy snowstorms raged a couple times, in addition to ten residents losing their way and freezing to death. Everything was calm in Rudin. Two months later, Reinhardt was thinking about the situation in the Northeast. She knew that in three years there would be a big fire there. Because the Northeast is cold and dry, there is always the danger of a mountain fire. But the scale of the Rayland mountain fire was different. It took over a year to put it out. The Northeast was almost completely destroyed. This was also the reason why Michael's father, the current emperor, had lost the trust of the people. The explanation for why the fire spread so far is one. Buried in the swampy soil of Raylan is a dirty coal called peat. Over the years, fallen leaves, mud, various boggy complications, mixed, hardened, and became an ignitable projectile. Be that as it may, no one had expected to find so much peat in Raylan soil. But the current Reinhardt knew. For starters, she needed to prevent a forest fire from starting. She could secure a solid capital if she sold the selected peat. But there was a small problem. Raylan's soil doesn't belong to the Reinhardt lands and she needed to get the right to mine it. But how? The girl was pulled out of her thoughts by Wilhelm, who called her by the acronym RAIN. Dietrich told Wilhelm to meet Reinhardt while he had business at the stables. The boy looked away, but the Viscountess admonished him to look the other person in the eye when speaking. William was still uncomfortable with the dialogue. They had spent an entire season on these lands, but in other areas that time could be counted as two. Reinhardt also instructed Wilhelm to address Dietrich with courtesy and deference, which caused the lad to look surprised and displeased. He clearly didn't want to follow it, even if the knight was already his mentor. Reinhardt hadn't talked to Dietrich face to face in a long time. He had spent the entire winter with the boy and had not left the plats at all, as he had to pay for all the deer carcasses he had eaten. Sometimes, on particularly frosty winter days, the girl called Wilhelm to her room, the warmest room in the castle. This angered Dietrich. A woman who had once been the crown prince's consort was dragging a boy to her room. Rumors of this could spread around, and no one would care that she was the deposed crown princess. And the man was right about that. Dietrich is very strict with Wilhelm. Reinhardt even thought that the knight takes the boy for a younger brother. Dietrich has no one but an older brother after all. The girl also noticed how Wilhelm had grown older. The scars on his neck and chin were gone. Reinhardt had no idea how much work Dietrich had done. Wilhelm's broad shoulders were pleasing to the eye, but it was his face that pleased them most. In the Viscountess's past life, on the day she had met Will Halona for the first and only time, the girl had seen that scar on his eyebrow in the same place. Could this boy not be Will Halona? 
Reinhardt withdrew her hand, afraid she was too close and had let herself get too close. But Wilhelm shook his head. He repeated the words Reinhardt herself had once told her to Dietrich. What's the big deal about being close to each other? The Viscountess, realizing this, took the boy's hand with a chuckle, making him wince even more. Suddenly, Wilhelm yanked her toward him and hugged her tightly. Now it was Reinhardt's turn to be embarrassed, because as a pity today she was wearing a dress that was too thin and she could feel absolutely everything. Wilhelm's body was burning and radiating heat. The boy was worried when he noticed the Viscountess's hesitation, but she waved him away and said that there was no one closer to her than Wilhelm. After that, they came together to Dietrich's stables. Then the man told Reinhardt the news of an order. It was a conscription from the capital. Reinhardt assumed that the order had come to a backwater like Rudin because he hated her. But Dietrich was also to some extent the reason. The total number of conscripts was 30, making up the entirety of Rudin's guard without a trace. And there should be only one officially recognized knight. The Alankesian Empire gave conscription orders to the lords of each province every winter. This was because starving tribes of barbarians would descend on the empire. In this case, the lords had a choice. Either send their soldiers or send money. Most choose to pay. It's more convenient and costs less. However, Rudin has no money at all. Originally, only 10 men were drafted from this depleted region. So this time, three times as many as usual are needed. Another knight is also needed. But in the spring, when the predators have cubs, they would come out to the houses and even attack people. So it was also necessary to ensure maximum safety. But if Rudin followed the decree without question, there would be no labor force left at all. Also, rumors of Dietrich's stay had spread throughout the area. When he left, a huge number of people came to his house. Dietrich was considered one of the most prominent knights of the empire, who had been with Marquis Renke on the battlefield more than once. So the rumors of him heading to Rudin was Michael's doing. He clearly wanted him dead on the way. They couldn't ask the neighboring domains for help either, for they caused the lords of the neighboring territories to fall under the hot hand as well. It was known because Dietrich had already asked Nathan Teen Manor to send half an army and two knights, but they only had two knights, but they only had two knights. Of them, one was the Lord's second son, and the other died due to illness. So all Rudin had to do was clench his teeth. Reinhardt cursed loudly as she cursed Michael for wanting to cut off the heir to their manor. Only a knight from Rudin could be sent into battle in place of the son of Nathan Dean's owner. But of the official knights, there was only Ernst himself. However, he would not go in his place. Dietrich cast a thoughtful glance at the practicing Wilhelm. Reinhardt immediately protested, barely catching a glimpse of the man's intention. But the arguments were against her. A guy like Wilhelm could handle it. He had broken the blade of the Chief of Guards last week and was growing very fast, as he had already changed three sets of clothes. If all of Rudin's guards are called in, the villagers will revolt. Wilhelm was destined to become a knight, and Dietrich asked to be sent as a knight from Nathenden. The man was well aware of how much Reinhardt treasured this child, but to complete her revenge properly, she must hold something stronger than a knife in her hand. Dietrich's advice was not to dwell on one child and let nothing spoil her plans. Watching the darkened expression on Reinhardt's face, Dietrich thought bitterly that she still had the same inability to be cold-blooded. The knight was then skeptical of the rumors that the girl had stabbed the crown prince in the leg and ended up in the dungeon. Since the named Reinhardt, who was given a name that was only given to the official heir of Rinke, could not have committed such an act. Marquis Rink had secured his daughter a place as the noblest woman in this world and made sure she was protected by the entire empire. But because that protection was too strong, Reinhardt could not learn to be strong on her own. She hadn't changed at all. In any case, they had no other way to keep Rudin's guard. Reinhardt, on the other hand, was now looking very pensive and even sinister. If Wilhelm replaces one knight, then conscripting only 15 men is a lie. One must pay a lot to rent even one knight. Besides, if it is about saving the life of the Lord's second son, they would not give a few warriors but a piece of land in return. For example, the swampy land of Raylan. 
There are tons of peat deposits buried in that land. At least their price would at least be comparable. At that rate, Villa Holland could be lent to him. Dietrich grinned. There was a reason the Marquis had given this girl such a name. The knight went down on one knee, humbly saying that he would follow his mistress's order. While hunting reindeer, Dietrich and Wilhelm talked about the legend of Halsey and Eludica. They wondered if Halsey hated Eludica because he interfered with her work and tried to lull her to sleep. On the other hand, Eludica loved her, otherwise Anilak would not have been born. William asked the knight to tell what happened after the birth of the goddess of spring, and he heeded this request. Halsey, the goddess of vengeance, was a very busy woman. There was no end to the people who begged for vengeance. However, exactly from the moment the child was born, Halsey took care of Anilak for a hundred days, and afterwards left the girl with Alutika. His castle was very far away, so the journey to that place took a full hundred days. She left Anilak, and without a moment's hesitation, she left the tower, because Halsey hated Alutika. But she loved Anilak, whom she carried under her heart to the point of madness. So every year the goddess willingly visited the castle to see her daughter. Of course, she did not even look at Alutika, because from the very beginning Halsey did not love this man, and she became a goddess of vengeance because of the man. Dietrich did not tell this, but Halsey gave birth to two more children by Alutika, because she was not the kind of adults who spoil everything. Here Wilhelm gave out an unexpected thought. When he said that Halsey, the woman who liked Aludica, looked at him like an intrusive gnat. He said that he would not care if he were him. At the time, Dietrich didn't know who the boy was thinking of since such thoughts came to his mind. But later the knight realized when Wilhelm had to cut the neck of a deer just to keep the Viscountess from going hungry. He undoubtedly always before, and even then too, had that look on his face when Reinhardt was around. Such a reckless boy, whose gaze was full of greed and malice. Dietrich could not allow to be near his mistress. It is bitter, when people grow up like ducklings, who look only at their mother, for one must first become a man. And then came the perfect opportunity to share Wilhelm with mistress, a summons. From Nadentine came a deed to transfer ownership of the marshy soils to Raylan. Sarah was curious as to why the Lord was accepting these worthless lands. But now it must be a matter of providing provisions for the soldiers who would be sent out at dawn to be conscripted. In order to have enough money for provisions, Reinhardt gave the jewelry to her mother, despite Dietrich's protests. The Crown Prince had confiscated all of the Rinke family's possessions, and the necklace was the only thing Reinhardt had left. But thanks to him, everything should go smoothly. Sarah bowed and set off to find a merchant willing to buy the necklace. At that, the woman called Reinhardt mistress for the first time. With Dietrich glaring at her with a judgmental look, the girl sent her away to make preparations for the battle. All organizational matters were soon finished. All that remained was to talk to Wilhelm. Wilhelm hesitated at the entrance to the study, for he had not had time to wash and smelled of sweat. Reinhardt waved him away, saying that she had long since gotten used to the smell of night sweat. Her father had once stopped abruptly before embracing his daughter as well. Wilhelm, with an impenetrable face, asked if Dietrich was the reason she had gotten used to it. The girl agreed, thinking that Ernst smelled twice as bad as her father. Wilhelm was suddenly very close. He leaned over and enclosed Reinhardt in a hug. The teenager sincerely hated the fact that the Viscountess was used to Dietrich. With this, he once again showed his considerable sense of possessiveness. Strangely enough, at that moment, Reinhardt was worried about Wilhelm's future reaction when he heard that he would become a knight sent by the Nadentine estate. Whatever Will Holona was, now he was just a small child that faithfully follows Reinhardt, and she is sending him to certain death because of money. The girl felt like a terrible person. The first thing she did was to apologize to Wilhelm and explain the situation. Rudin barely had 30 guards, and if he goes as a knight, the number will be reduced by half. With that, the Lord would be able to protect the inhabitants from predators in the spring. She had no right to let him refuse, no matter how much she wanted to. Reinhardt is the mistress of these lands. 
she must protect the lives of its inhabitants. And so in return, the girl promised to pray every night for Wilhelm's well, Belling. At night, when the moonlight descends on the land, day after day, before going to bed, she will pray for him. Therefore, Reinhardt Rink held out her ancestral sword to Wilhelm and asked him to follow her to war for her sake. This sword his father didn't even have time to bear when he fell from his horse and died afterward. And since it was a very expensive item, Reinhardt hoped that Wilhelm would come back with it. Madame Rink was going to cripple the Crown Prince, not only his leg, but his life as well. Crown Prince Michael Alankis must say goodbye to his miserable life with this blade. Therefore, Wilhelm is obliged to return with it. Seeing the seriousness and weight of Reinhardt's spoken words, Wilhelm promised to return. And lastly, he asked her for a handkerchief, as in the old books where ladies give them to knights going off to war. Without thinking, Reinhardt tore a piece of cloth from her robes and wrapped it around the hilt of her sword. She didn't have a handkerchief, but only a few weekend dresses, so even that little was expensive. Wilhelm was glad of that, too. He smiled, blushing once again. Two days later, Wilhelm and Dietrich, along with 15 sentries, set off north. At that point, it had been about nine months since Reinhardt had stabbed Michel Alanx in the leg. Good news had come to Rudin Manor that this year's conscripted soldiers were returning. Given when the message had been written, they would arrive in two weeks at the most. In honor of that, Reinhardt even allowed Sarah to take the apple cider she had bought. She dismissed the steward's economy. For now, they didn't have to watch their expenses so carefully. Time passed like an arrow. It was the third summer since Dietrich and Wilhelm had left the estate. Baron Nadentine had gladly given the marshlands to Raylan, and exactly two months later he regretted it. When he saw the peat dug out of the land spreading like hotcakes, he immediately sent a representative. Of course, Reinhardt had prepared a clear answer for this occasion. Ruins of the Cold Lands was the title of the book written by the first empress of the state, Amerilis de Fapina Alanques. Although Reinhardt didn't know why she was in Rudena, but the book clearly stated the existence of peat in the marshlands. That last part was pretty weird. What can I say? In any case, thanks to the proceeds from the sale of peat, Rudin has definitely changed. And even the famously harsh winters had gotten a little warmer, so no one had died of cold in the last two years. As the rumors spread, many people from other territories had moved here and the number of vacant positions among the guards had decreased considerably. On top of that, Reinhardt made a gift to the manager Sarah as soon as the opportunity arose. By then, the attitude of the people of the manor towards their new lord had changed. They became more welcoming and friendly. Everything was going smoothly. There was one thing, though. The war was still not over. Battles with barbarians usually started in spring and ended in the middle of summer, all because they had to harvest their lands in the summer. This time, however, the war dragged on for two years, and the reason for that was William. He killed the chief's son, which paid huge dividends for Nadanthine, but the enraged barbarians of the north left the harvest, which led to the continuation of the war. It was not such a desperate situation, however, and also because of Wilhelm. Because the boy, not even 20 years old, but fought the barbarians like a former commander, people began to call Mad Dog. Dietrich reported in his letter that the Margrave of Glencia had promised to pay Wilhelm for the transition to his subordination, but the boy flatly refused to change his master. The Margrave, of course, was upset. But if the daughter of the Marquis of Rink is his master, it is well worth it. Wilhelm was constantly on the battlefield, so it was not easy for him to contact Reinhardt. For the most part, it was Dietrich who reported everything. And in his last letter, he also wrote that except for his habit of behaving recklessly on the battlefield, Wilhelm had become an excellent knight. What's worse is exactly a knight, not a soldier, because he couldn't get along with the rest of the soldiers. To be honest, Dietrich thought this was his personal shame. He furthermore believed that it was because of Reinhardt, who overly coddled his first apprentice throughout his growing up. Ernst also assumed that they would soon put an end to the war. Six of the seven leaders of the barbarian tribes were already dead. Of course, the tribes had also been defeated. Now, for the sake of trapping the ringleader, they need to attack the northern zone. 
keeping in touch with Reinhardt in such a position would be difficult. Dietrich also received a letter from his older brother. His wife had given birth to a child, and the knight asked for a vacation after the fighting was over to finally get a look at his niece's face. In addition to Dietrich's letter, the envelope contained a scrap of paper that read, day after day, looking at the sword, I think of you. It was not hard to guess who the message was from. Looking at it, Reinhardt couldn't hold back her tears. She missed Dietrich and Wilhelm madly. That same day in the late afternoon, the girl heard about the news from the battlefield. The first news had come. Of death, Reinhardt could not believe her ears. A messenger arrived and gave a brief account of what had happened. All the forces had been concentrated on the outer wall, but in a moment the situation had changed and the barbarian troops had attacked simultaneously from both sides. Reinforcements could not reach the outpost, which was guarded by Knight Dietrich. Having belatedly learned of this news, Knight Wilhelm quickly dispersed the barbarians nearby and rushed to her Ernst. However, the leader of the barbarian forces was present on the battlefield, and so the battle lasted longer than they had anticipated. When her Wilhelm cut off the chief's head with an axe, the sun in the east had already lit up the sky. Thus ended the Empire's war with the barbarians, and so ended the life of Dietrich, who fought bravely alone. Reinhardt desperately did not want to believe the messenger. A veil of bitter tears immediately covered her eyes. She had laughed so hard when she had read Dietrich's last letter in the morning, while he had died a week ago. She remembered with pain the lines where the knight had lambasted Reinhardt for spoiling Wilhelm, and the lines where he had asked for a leave of absence to go and see his newborn niece. And the Viscountess smiled so happily as she read it all, while Dietrich was already dead. Reinhardt's legs gave out with grief, and she fell to the floor, sobbing. Dietrich, the one who had shared a bed with her as a child, listening to her father's stories. A friend. In the end, Reinhardt was the only one from her memories who had survived, because of a man who had treated the life of another so carelessly. Because of herself, Dietrich was dead. The conscripted soldiers finally returned to Rudin. They embraced their friends and relatives whom they had left behind for three long years. But behind the rows of joyous soldiers, there were soldiers carrying a wooden coffin in mournful silence. Behind the coffin walked Wilhelm. Whispers rippled through the crowd. People hardly recognized in the night that beloved child of the lady. Now the mere sight of him made the common people tremble. And if that night was Wilhelm, then it was Mr. Ernst in the coffin. Wilhelm stopped and looked at Reinhardt, who had come out to meet the soldiers still as beautiful, but in a black morning dress. Wilhelm stepped toward her, wanting to embrace her, but missed her. She pushed him away. The first thing Reinhardt rushed to the coffin, which did not contain Dietrich's body, because it could not even be found. Tears came to her eyes again. But Reinhardt could not allow herself to do so in the presence of soldiers who had just returned alive from brutal battles. Dietrich had died and they had survived. For them, and they had survived. For them and their kin, today was a celebration. The Lord stood up and vigorously congratulated the end of the war. In honor of this, everyone was to be compensated according to their achievements. In addition, returning soldiers were entitled to farmland free of charge for a period of 10 years. Through choking tears, Reinhardt announced the banquet. Everyone was happy because this endless war was finally over. There were cheers from everywhere. Everyone was rejoicing, except for two people. A drenching downpour fell from the sky. Two men stood in the cemetery, Reinhardt and a man. They were Dietrich's older brother, who had refused to accept a coffin that didn't even contain a corpse. It was impossible to find any of Dietrich's belongings to put inside. And since he died as a knight of Rudin, he would be buried in those lands accordingly. Dietrich had chosen Reinhardt, and that choice proved decisive. The man's cold tone was hitting the girl's still unhealed wounds. The Viscountess lay down tiredly on the bed. Post-war time, preparations for the funeral. A visit from Dietrich's older brother, Baden Ernst. For some reason, even the heir to the family, Glencia, himself came. 
He was completely out of his mind. After that day, Reinhardt was not even able to say hello to Wilhelm, a child who, through her fault, had been fighting bloody battles for two and a half years in a place he was unfamiliar with. He shouldn't have done that. He needed to call Wilhelm and talk to him, but first, he needed to change his clothes. There was a knock on the bedroom door. Reinhardt thought it was Sarah, so she asked him to help her unbutton her dress. But it was Wilhelm who answered unexpectedly. Rank immediately pulled the dress back over her shoulders and sat down embarrassed. Three years ago, Wilhelm could definitely be called a little boy. However, the man standing in front of Reinhardt now, though the girl doubted he could be called just a man, facing a predator in the thick of the forest. Was there any point in recognizing its gender? Wilhelm gustily hugged Reinhardt, and the girl, at first taken aback, apologized. It was said that Wilhelm had guarded Dietrich's empty coffin for three days. It must have been the first separation he'd ever had to endure. He had been through so much, and Reinhardt blamed herself for daring to treat him so carelessly and push him away. She shouldn't have done that. Wilhelm didn't need this apology. He only wanted to hear that Reinhardt was glad to have him back, clasped gently to his broad chest. The Viscountess cried again. How could she compare a kind young man to a predator? She thought of it bitterly. She had made Wilhelm like that. The knight snuggled closer, asking her to keep talking. Wilhelm admitted that he longed madly for Reinhardt. Unbearably long nights on the battlefield, she was the only one he missed. Only her. The next day, the heir to the Glencia family, Fernet Glencia, tried to buy Wilhelm back from Reinhardt for a hundred thousand alenki. But the girl in a dejected state declared that the sum for such a transaction was very small, which surprised the man a lot. The heir of the Glencia family came from the places where the war with the barbarians broke out. Reinhardt wondered why he had stayed in Rudin when the funeral was over. Certainly the man had an ulterior motive. There were two ways to change a knight's affiliation. The first was, as it was now, one could offer the owner money and take it with him. The second was that the knight had the right to change the owner himself by means of a chevalier's oath. Most likely William rejected Furnish Glencia's offer, and that's why he came to Reinhardt. And she too will undoubtedly refuse. Officially, the Viscountess argued that a hundred thousand Alenki was not the most reasonable price for a knight less than 20 years old who had beheaded the leader of a nation of barbarians. But the man was ready to increase the amount in five times. Nevertheless, Reinhardt flatly refused even to rent, not that to sell for good. In the heat of the moment, Fernox said that such a knight as Wilhelm has nothing to do in Rudana, where there are only 42 soldiers and no one to command. The man even promised to pay Wilhelm an additional 5,000 Alanka every month. He also promised to give him his sister. Reinhardt was shocked by this. Did the Margrave of Glencia really consider Wilhelm as his son-in-law? But Rink's worries were in vain. Her knight was interested in nothing but herself. The heir to the Glencius family, panting with anger, left Rudin with nothing. Reinhardt and Wilhelm stared back at the departing men. It was incomprehensible to the Viscountess how a man as intemperate as Fernach could command men on the battlefield. However, according to Wilhelm, the man was quite popular. Reinhardt furtively glanced at the profile of her interlocutor. He looked like a completely different person compared to last night. Suddenly, Reinhardt wondered if Wilhelm himself was popular with the girls since he was so handsome. This drove the knight into a blush. The girl tried to talk about some small things like his bangs growing out, but Wilhelm took her hand and admitted that he had fought, thinking only of Reinhardt's words. Be sure to come back repeated wordlessly in his thoughts. And he had come back and would always return in the future. So Wilhelm asked Reinhardt for a reward he could not yet tell her about. Fernet Glencia and his adjutant, Alzen Stugel, were sitting in a campfire by the fire. They were discussing Wilhelm, or rather how crazy he was. Fernet recalled that when Wilhelm arrived with the severed head of the chieftain's son, everyone was delighted and only the Margrave of Glencia sighed heavily. 
The northern barbarians came to the lands of Glencius every spring. It didn't do much harm to either side. The barbarians were a group of beggars who had been protesting for about a month for food transfers. If you gave them one or two food stores, they disappeared without a trace, and the soldiers didn't fight much. Instead, in the name of war, Glencia could command thousands of soldiers. It was an equal exchange. It was like that, but William cut off the chief's son's head instead of taking him alive. The knight, a mere boy, explained his deliberate murder by the fact that the enemy had touched his sword and insulted him. Fernick recognized the sword as the weapon of the Marquis of Rinky. The man had heard that the deposed queen had been banished from the capital and had come to the castle of Rudin, and that the boy, the knight borrowed from Rudin. Fernick did not think that there was such a madman in his master's service. In short, the heir to the Glencia family had no idea what to do next, bring a portrait of his younger sister. Also useless. Suddenly, a clatter of hooves was heard. A man who turned out to be Wilhelm was approaching them on horseback. On the battlefield, people often change. If you see a man being hacked to pieces a few times, the understanding of normal becomes distorted. In the camp, while still fighting, Wilhelm heard rumors that the crown prince had remarried. In the capital, flowers and bread were distributed for three days. There was terrible turmoil, and someone had been fighting in the land of Glencius for months. The soldiers also talked about how beautiful the new crown princess was. They had no doubts about her beauty, for as they laughingly noted, she had thrown out the last crown princess. Now they were discussing Reinhardt, defaming her name with taunts about how good she would be in bed, for she was no longer a virgin. Suddenly, the loudest of the soldiers was pierced through by a sword. The sword belonged to Wilhelm, who had killed the man in cold blood. There was a second of confusion, after which the soldiers became indignant and demanded an explanation from the knight. But Wilhelm moved forward and massacred the men, slashing their throats as if they were sworn enemies rather than allies. Dietrich barely managed to drag his furious pupil away from the soldiers. Wilhelm pushed his mentor away. A sword gleamed in the blow. Wilhelm, standing amidst a mountain of corpses, declared that the knight had been sentenced to death for insulting the imperial family. In short, this man, now arriving at their camp, was originally a madman. The war had also changed him for the worse. The adjutant watched the conversation between the two men with tension. Fernick's face was rapidly changing to one of absolute amazement and even confusion. When Wilhelm finished speaking, the man gustily turned around and told the adjutant that they should return to Glicia as soon as possible. Jumping into their saddles, they galloped away. Wilhelm escorted them with an unreadable look. In the morning, Reinhardt found bread by her bedside. She assumed who exactly had brought it to the Viscountess's room. Wilhelm, he had done that as a child too. The girl thought about the fact that instead of fighting, the knight should be taught etiquette in dealing with girls. Saying this, she unconsciously addressed Dietrich, but she hesitated half a word. She remembered. He was gone. Michelle Alankis had taken another man. Reinhardt blamed herself, for she should have wounded the crown prince properly then. If she could go back again. Suddenly, it turned out that Wilhelm was in the room all this time, who had not managed to leave before the Viscountess woke up. He kissed her hand, terribly embarrassing her. Wilhelm asked her if she liked the lands, and when he heard an affirmative answer, he promised to give her a gift. Hearing an affirmative answer to his question about the lands, Wilhelm promised to give the girl this. At that moment, Reinhardt did not pay much attention to these words. She thought it was natural for a child to treat her parent in such a way, and thought his words were a joke. But Wilhelm suddenly invited her to go for a walk. In this innocent proposal, the girl also did not see a trick and naturally agreed. They were interrupted by Marka, who burst in, looking excited about what was going on outside. Reinhardt immediately went after her. As she stepped into the castle courtyard, the girl froze, eyes wide in surprise. Before her stood frequent rows of knights in full ammunition. Reinhardt, who had not recovered from her first impressions, was stunned even more by Wilhelm, who said that he had returned the land, because his lord liked the land. That evening, 
When William caught up with Furnish Glencius and his adjutant, he offered them a deal. He wanted to be given Glencia's army. After all, the northern barbarians were gone, and the Margrave of Glencia was probably now contemplating what he should do with the 10,000-man army he had assembled under the pretense of barbarians. If the Marquis of Rinky were alive, the imperial family, through a marriage contract with him, could use force to restrain Glencia. But the Marquis is dead and his soldiers have dispersed, and at this moment, the imperial family will try any way they can to weaken Glencia. It's good if it ends up with just an order to disband the soldiers. William thought it more appropriate to attack the empire first and become the independent state of Glencia. The adjutant, upon barely hearing this statement, immediately shushed Fernach in an attempt to shield him from such rebellious sentiments. The latter, however, pulled him back by the shoulder, earnestly inquiring of Wilhelm whether this was what Sir Ernst had taught him. But Wilhelm shook his head. His mentor was a good man who never even had a thought of rebellion. He wanted to push through a proposal for negotiations and ask the emperor properly. Wilhelm himself, on the other hand, was going to engage Glencia's soldiers in a territorial war and return all the lands of the northeast to Rudin. Fernac nervously cried out that such a thing was ridiculous and he had no reason to trust the knight and give him his soldiers to support him. To this Wilhelm accused him of lacking the courage to act drastically. After all, if successful, Glencia would gain a strong friendly territory to ally with, the mistress of vast lands in the northeast. Furnak reprimanded himself. This did not sound like nonsense. Below Rudin was Orient, the richest land in the east. But unlike Marquis Rinke, who was favorable to the imperial family, Reinhardt was extremely hostile to it. If she becomes the mistress, and if Glencia helps her to do so. Furnak latched onto the last argument that the emperor would hold them back twice as much in such a case, but Wilhelm claimed that the restraints would be gone by then. Alzen tried to say that everything the knight said was utter nonsense. Furnak told the adjutant to stand back, and while Alzen was sitting by the fire, Wilhelm said something to Furnak that struck him even more. And after that, without a second's hesitation, the heir of Glencius and his adjutant set off, and now Wilhelm was smiling nonchalantly for Reinhardt. The girl, however, was not thrilled with this antics. Her concern was that they simply would not be able to maintain such a large number of soldiers. After all, this wasn't land, these were people. With an eerie calmness, Wilhelm threw a cloak over Reinhardt's shoulders and the girl became truly frightened. Even though she had looked into his eyes countless times, his gaze at that moment was alien and eerie as if Reinhardt was seeing Wilhelm for the first time. The knight at this time said, in an even voice, that the Lord didn't trust him as much as Dietrich. In his opinion, if the man who brought so many soldiers was Dietrich, then Reinhardt would surely shriek with joy. He honestly admitted that he didn't know everything that Reinhardt was sad about, nor did he know about her anger. But according to him, Michael Alankis had taken Dietrich away from them, Therefore, this hatred he shared with Reinhardt. And as the knight said all this and kissed her hand ceremoniously, while on one knee, Reinhardt became increasingly aware. Wilhelm now seemed an unbearable stranger to her. Reinhardt stood confused. All this time, she had seen Wilhelm only as an innocent child and thought that he did not understand what was happening. But as it turned out, that child had time to grow up, and she hadn't realized when. Wilhelm grew up feeding off her feelings. At his words, that he was only trying to return his lord's due, the girl pressed her lips together. She reminded him that she had never asked for anything to be returned to her. And even if she was going to do that, she should have been doing it on her own. Suddenly, Wilhelm said that Reinhardt was going to do it with his help anyway, that she was going to use her apprentice as a tool anyway. And then, whatever he did would be the result of the effort Reinhardt had put into raising him, and that included her anger. Wilhelm was going to be the thunder and lightning of Hurricane Reinhardt. A hurricane has a path, and thunder and lightning only follow it, having no will. And Wilhelm would clear Reinhardt's path, hoping that the road he would pave would be to her liking. The Summer Rudin declared territorial war. Everyone scoffed. 
saying that the deposed princess had finally lost her mind. All because Reinhardt had put a 20-year-old commoner in charge. When Nadantin surrendered himself, everyone laughed at his master. But when the spacious and wealthy Del Mario lost to Rudin, no one laughed anymore. The Alenki's empire didn't interfere in the relations of territories unless the matter affected the taxes collected by the imperial family. Furthermore, the speed of the territory's conquest was unprecedented for these unexpected events to be noticed by the imperial family. Thus, the war ended in the winter of that year and brought six new territories to Rudin. The galvanized soldiers went on the offensive to the east. At one point, the army, numbering a thousand soldiers, doubled in size. In an instant, a rumor spread that this was the work of Margrave Glensius. Famous feudal lords voiced their disapproval, but it was too late. From the East, Orient, Delmaril, and Fala, all who dominated the surrounding territories as powerful feuds knelt. The Knight of Rudin soon changed his nickname from Mad Dog of Rudin to Thunder of Rudin, and the territories that gave up the most taxes in the empire became the land of Reinhardt. At the meeting, the clearly bored crown prince proposed to simply rescind the order to disband the order to disband the army given to the Margrave of Glencius and have him control the territory of Rudin. However, the emperor lambasted his son. Half of Rudin's soldiers are backed by the Margrave of Glencia. This means that if he summons them, these men will return and be loyal to him. It's highly likely that Margrave Glencia and the deposed princess are in on it. But Michael thought that was why it was better to withdraw the order to disband Glencia's soldiers, because then Reinhardt would lose his army, and the imperial family would be able to interfere with Glencia and Rudin's relationship. The emperor clenched his fists in anger, calling his son an idiot. If he let the Margrave gather as many soldiers as he wanted, there was no guarantee that he would return the soldiers sent to Rudin and not gather new ones to build up the force. The emperor leaned on his arm and lamented to himself that his only son was such a moron. He didn't notice people's abilities, had no insight into politics. If the prince had been personally involved in the campaign to suppress the Sarawak rebellion from the beginning, none of this would have happened. According to the imperial physician, Michel became cranky after he was shot in the leg, uninterested in business and only thinks of his own well-being. However, this is the Alanki's empire, the country that the prince will have to rule. The emperor was distracted from his sorrowful thoughts by one of those present. He reported that Rudin had achieved numerous victories through the acquisition of an outstanding knight. This knight had been trained by the second son of the Ernst family, but he had not actually received an official appointment. This man was not originally a knight and entered the war using a false identity. Normally, one wouldn't be charged for such a thing because they would die before being charged, but this was a crime. Based on that, they could invite the knight to the capital, and then he would personally pay for the crime. A letter arrived from the imperial palace, inviting him to the capital for a private audience with the emperor. In return, the imperial family guaranteed two things, the restoration of Marquis Reinck's title and the return of his father's body. After Reinhardt had crippled Michelle, the Reinke family had suffered significant damage. Title ranks and possessions were confiscated. The knights came under the control of the imperial family, and her father's body had to be buried in a public cemetery outside the capital. The girl could not refuse these conditions. She was finally one step closer to Michael, and unlike in the past, now that the girl was being kicked out of Rudin, she was ordered to go through the Crystal Gate. Crystal Gates they were created from crystals containing mana and were a transportation device that allowed for quick travel from gate to gate. It was said that once upon a time a very long time ago, magic existed on the continent, but those times had passed, and magic naturally fell into decline. The founder of the Alankesian Empire, Amaralis Alankis, being the last mage on the continent, created crystal gates, becoming a new mode of transportation they brought prosperity to the continent, and the Alanki's family was able to firmly establish themselves as the ruling family of the empire. Because unless you are related to the Alanki's, you need a resonance crystal to pass through the gate. And now Count Molly, 
was actively arguing with Reinhardt, demanding to disarm her men, as passing through the gate with weapons was considered unacceptable. The girl objected. She had already passed through the crystal gates as crown princess, and passing through them, they would not only go straight to the imperial palace, but also meet the 20 knights who guarded the place. And of course, passing through the gate was an order from the majestic emperor, so they would follow it. However, if the order is so complicated, Reinhardt would rather get to the capital on horseback. After all, it was the imperial family that needed urgency, not her. The Count would not back down, now pressing the point that Wilhelm could not in any case appear in the capital without permission with a sword exceeding one Rylus. His argument was that there were no exceptions to this rule, not even for the crown prince, but Reinhardt stiffly cut off that this sword was left to her by her late father, and even knowing the significance of returning to the capital, she could not take the sword away from her knight. In the end, the Count, gritting his teeth, retreated after all. As the man disappeared into another hall, Wilhelm thanked Reinhardt for protecting his weapon. The girl answered nothing, only asking Sarah to take care of the domain in his absence. There wasn't a man who didn't like the fact that the number of controlled territories had increased, but in about six months, Rudin had grown to such a size that it became difficult for the average person to handle. Wilhelm fought over the territories without realizing the scale and Reinhardt and Sarah had to deal with what was left after the victories. The system of government was still unstable, and the Lord of the Lands had to leave, so Reinhardt tried to promise to return as soon as possible, but Sarah asked her to finish all her business and return to her post quietly. When Sarah had said on their first meeting that she was glad to see Reinhardt, she wasn't lying. Had there been anyone in the world back then who would have been at ease with the former crown princess? but Sarah had never hated her mistress. So far, the girl had given Rudin a great deal. Now it was Rudin's turn to support her lord. No matter how long it took, Sarah asked to ride in peace. In return, Reinhardt should do her thing and return with honors. Reinhardt smiled warmly, genuinely grateful for those words. From the moment she was kicked out of the capital, she had never imagined that she would live such a life. The thought crept into her mind. Maybe her father had given her this chance so that his daughter would not give up. In that case, Reinhardt should not run away anymore. She turned to Wilhelm with the intention of telling him something before departing. That day, after the conversation at the fortress, Wilhelm had ceased to be familiar to Reinhardt. Once pressed against his shoulder, she had felt calm, but he was no longer the earnest child protected by her. The child whom the girl thought she understood nothing had pierced her heart. He had followed Reinhardt with his blind faith, but she didn't think she could repay him for it. It was shameful and hard. Winning one victory after another that everyone had heard of. Alenki's the war hero who knew no defeat. It was too hard for Reinhardt to do the job of the head of the lands he had dedicated to her. Though the girl had not thought of such a thing. Yet in a place unknown to her, her revenge was going like butter, and she had to give Wilhelm an appropriate reward, but for such accomplishments, Reinhardt had no idea how to even repay for them. And now, before passing through the gate, there was something she wanted to tell him. After all, the fact that they were heading to the capital was like putting her head in the lion's mouth, and before shoving it in there, the girl should trust her knight completely. Reinhardt told Wilhelm that he would be able to pass through the gate, even without the crystal, because he was the son of the Emperor. She couldn't tell him where she got this information from, but she asked him to trust her. While the girl was saying this, she pressed her forehead against his chest. It made her nervous that the knight was speechless. But when he raised his arm to embrace Reinhardt, she noticed that the cloth of her torn sleeve, which she had given as a farewell, was still wrapped around the hilt of her sword. Wilhelm stiffened and apologized for not returning this cloth to his mistress, as he had proved too greedy. But Reinhardt, on the contrary, was pleased that he treasured the gift. It assured her of something. No matter how Wilhelm grew and changed, the child from that day would not disappear. And Reinhardt recognized her plans, in which she was going to use Wilhelm as a tool. But she trusted him with her father's sword. 
no matter what happened in the capital, no matter what happened there. Even if the knight's heart changed and he left his mistress while he carried that sword, Reinhardt Reinke would trust him infinitely. And one day he must return to her. She was afraid of Wilhelm, but it was because of this fear that the girl would not repeat her past life. In this life, Wilhelm belonged to her. She ruffled his hair, and an embarrassed Wilhelm decided to share something with her as well. Leaning down to her ear, he revealed what he also knew about his origins, about being the Emperor's son. It turned out that Wilhelm also knew of his origins. Upon hearing this confession, Reinhardt's eyes widened in surprise, and she abruptly pulled away from the knight. The girl asked him since when did he know about it. Wilhelm tried to calm the overly agitated mistress by pulling her against him. He couldn't answer her question right now. It was very bad timing that the arriving Sir Alzen entered the hall, catching Reinhardt in the arms of her own knight. The girl hurriedly moved away from Wilhelm, who quietly told her that they would continue their unfinished conversation later. With that, he made Lord Rudin even more desperate, and he strode forward, ordering him to get his horse ready. This was how it all turned out in the end. Reinhardt kept wondering why Fernek Glencia had given them so many soldiers. It wasn't gratuitous. It was just Wilhelm himself acting as collateral. He was using the blood of the imperial family that flowed within him. In that case, it would mean that the royal family was involved in Rudin's every move, and the imperial palace had no reason to worry. The reason why Michael was the emperor's only son was because of the empress. Due to her age, the imperial family couldn't have any more children, so the only crown prince was the dummy Michael. With the existence of another candidate for crown prince, the emperor would have nothing left but to welcome him with joy. Finally, they reached the crystal gate. The count entered first. Reinhardt froze in indecision. Wilhelm suddenly leaned toward her and reminded her that he still had not received the promised reward, for the knight had returned as she had asked. And from now on, Wilhelm promised to return alive every time. That was why he had demanded the reward. When asked by Reinhardt what exactly he should be given, Wilhelm asked to give himself. The moment the girl heard this, her head went blank, and Wilhelm continued to speak. What he had always wanted was always, in every moment, was Reinhardt. And when they came close to the crystal gate, Wilhelm confessed his love to the girl. In the bedroom in front of the crown prince, sat his wife Dulcinea. Dulcinea came from a small country, the Duchy of Canaria. When the Alanki's empire took the girl as a hostage, she was only 12. And the last gift her homeland gave this child was a tasteless and odorless poison, which she had to chew if she became unbearable. Hostage to the empire, locked in a dilapidated palace, ignored in it even by the servants. That's how she spent 10 years. Falling in love with someone was simply impossible for her. Every time the crown prince's leg hurt, his wife, the princess of Canaria, washed his leg. Today the prince was in a particularly foul mood because Reinhardt Rink was to appear at the palace. Michel hated her. He had hoped that on the way to Rudin this woman would be torn by bandits, or she would freeze to death. But she had survived, despite rumors that she had been stabbed in the stomach by some unknown vagrant, and now Reinhardt was also the head of the Great Lands. The prince didn't understand how she had the conscience to come to the capital. Michelle was going to make her regret for the rest of her life and lay her ex-wife's proud head on the scaffold. Thinking about it, he remembered the gift for Dulcinea, which he immediately ordered to bring. It was an expensive piece of jewelry that he wanted her to wear at the reception in honor of the head of the lands. Although Dulcinea was not even invited, Michelle was determined to attend with his wife. He wanted Dulcinea to show Reinhardt how splendidly she was reigning over the crown princess seat taken from her. And having lived her entire life as a shadow, Dulcinea knew exactly what answer to give. It is, of course, a succinct yes. A short time later, the Imperial family, including Michael and his wife, gathered at the official meeting place. The prince ordered her not to look at the floor, but to look proudly forward. But when the emperor coughing ostentatiously nearby, Dulcinea once again ducked her head, ashamed. At last, the arrival of Lord Rudin and her knight was announced, but barely seeing his ex-wife, Michelle froze in astonishment. Dulcinea couldn't find a place to be before meeting Reinhardt Rinke. 
the crown she had worn in the past, the luxurious jewelry that adorned her. Now it was all worn by the Princess of Canaria, and Dulcinea just didn't know how to look into the eyes of the woman who had lost everything because of her. Michel stood by her side and gritted his teeth, muttering insults at Reinhardt. The head of Rune arrived at the Imperial Palace without a single piece of jewelry. Dulcinea seemed to look at Reinhardt with a look of dread, as if she was saying with her entire appearance, Bring back my father's corpse and everything you took from me. This made the prince's wife shake involuntarily, causing Michael's anger as he had told her not to be so depressed, especially in front of Reinhardt. The emperor was also in a pensive state. He had summoned Reinhardt under the pretext of congratulating her on becoming the great head of the lands. It should be an honorable thing. But even so, to come with such an appearance, she came in her father's mourning clothes. The Count introduced Reinhardt as the Viscountess. The Emperor also called her by her status as a Viscountess to belittle her. But the girl didn't react, so she came here to regain her status as Marquess as Marquess of Rank. But His Majesty did not intend to return her status from the beginning, however. Knight Reinhardt, Wilhelm raised his head in a bow, and the Emperor couldn't believe his eyes. Interrupting the Count who started to speak, the ruler asked the knight how old he was. Wilhelm was 20 this year, and something in His Majesty's mind came together. He praised the knight for such impressive accomplishments at such a young age and asked his last name. Reinhardt explained that Wilhelm's mother had lost her family in a barbarian attack and died after barely giving birth to a child. But the Emperor did not relent, now inquiring about Wilhelm's father, or at the very least a marriage certificate. Reinhardt said evasively that it was not something that should be discussed in the Amaralis Hall, because it could become a weakness of one family. After that, the Emperor suddenly addressed the girl as Marquis Rinke, and prophesied that the negotiations regarding the return of Marquis Rinke's territories should be quick and productive. He therefore summoned them an hour later to his garden at tea time. Prince Michael stood as if thunderstruck by his father's action, and only stared in surprise at the Emperor and the guests. His Majesty invited Reinhardt to a banquet in honor of the birth of the new great head of the lands in two days. The Crown Prince didn't understand what all this was supposed to mean. Neither did those present. The return of the territories. It's just a bait to restrain Reinhardt and execute the knight. And Michelle was literally shaking with anger and resentment. He mentally screamed that he would definitely kill Reinhardt. At this time, the prince's wife blushed. She noticed that Wilhelm was looking at her and smiling. Reinhardt's eyes glittered feverishly. Inside herself, she was jubilant. They had finally met Michael Alenkis. The girl noticed the cane in his hands. A limp then. Reinhardt hoped that the crown prince's life was like hell. Just like hell, just like hell. Just like his ex-wife's past life. Reinhardt had only come back for revenge against Michelle. She was going to take from him the life he had lived until now. Reinhardt would make it clear to him what hell is like in real life. With these thoughts, the Lord left the hall. They were invited to tea at an hour where they had to please the Emperor. The man would definitely remember that Wilhelm was his son. Reinhardt was accosted by Alzen, Fernach's adjutant. He had come for something, for there was payment for Rudin taking Glincia's soldier and to prove the kinship between William and the Emperor, the girl must show Alzen the crystal, but she must also show it to the Emperor during the tea party. There were too many eyes on them right now. The girl had to do the right thing, so she told Alzen that the Amaryllis would be blooming this season. Amaryllis was the name of the first Empress, and it was the same flower that was painted on the coat of arms of the Imperial family. The fact that the flower would bloom this season meant that Reinhardt would provide proof that would be more convincing than the crystal. Amaryllis Crest. Reinhardt exhaled tiredly. Too many worrisome matters had fallen on her shoulders. Wilhelm leaned toward her slightly, advising her to rest in the room, prepared for the great head of the lands. Alzen, who had observed this scene, was unpleasantly surprised. It seemed the rumors that the head of Rudin was with the young knight might have been true. The adjutant already wanted to get the crystal and return home as soon as possible. 
Finally, Reinhardt sat down on the bed in her room. She looked at the disposable crystal in her hand. It shatters after you use it to go through the crystal gate. However, one crystal was still in Reinhardt's possession. Reliable proof that Wilhelm is a blood relative of the Alankis. With this crystal, Reinhardt would be able to gain the Emperor's trust. Wilhelm offered himself as an escort at the tea party, as she might try to be attacked. Now is the best time for those who want to destroy Rudin, which was previously surrounded by power. If Reinhardt, the great head of the lands, were to die, the territory would also collapse naturally. They needed to be prepared for the Emperor to try to kill the girl, but there was little chance of that happening because Wilhelm seemed to like him. But even though it wasn't a bad thing for Reinhardt if Wilhelm became the crown prince, she still asked if the knight himself wanted to become the Emperor's son. To this, the knight suddenly admitted that he wasn't sure if he wished to be a prince. But that being said, Wilhelm would prefer to leave it up to Reinhardt. Right now, however, he just wanted the girl to kiss his forehead. Reinhardt blushed. She remembered that confession again, and her mind went blank. She didn't know how to react to that, so she escorted Wilhelm out the door, referring to her desire to sleep. She was really having a hard time with him now. Reinhardt and Wilhelm arrived at the tea party in the garden and greeted the Emperor courteously. The latter greeted them in return, once again addressing Reinhardt as Marquez. Reinhardt rightly reasoned that since the Emperor had called her Marquez, he had no intention of slitting her throat. At this time, the Emperor turned to Wilhelm and also invited him to sit down at the table. Reinhardt immediately became agitated because she forgot to tell the knight about the etiquette of the Imperial Palace. However, contrary to her fears, Wilhelm gave a perfect answer and continued to stand, as he was not supposed to sit next to respected aristocrats. The Emperor was clearly pleased. He got straight to the point, declaring the return of Reinhardt's rights to the Marquis of Reinhardt's rights to the Marquis's family, as well as lands and properties, except those given to Michael. This would include the return of the Marquis's body. But before that, the man wished to see the birth certificate of Mrs. Reinke's knighthood. Reinhardt was going to give it to him personally, so she stood up from the table. The knights near the emperor became wary. They were wary of her. A woman who had stabbed the crown prince's leg. Surely they couldn't even imagine what she was capable of pulling off this time. Reinhardt held out her birth certificate. That document, of course, was a forgery. What was truly important was the crystal inside. No one would be able to interfere with the secret and genuine transaction. Through it, Reinhardt would build a special trust with the Emperor. By evening, Reinhardt collapsed tiredly onto her bed. She had gotten a lot of things done in this endless day, and it was still not ending. Wilhelm, meanwhile, ordered to prepare clothes for Reinhardt and him, as he was to be officially appointed knight at the banquet. The girl was surprised by this. She did not understand how Wilhelm knew about the appointment. Yes, and he had been observing etiquette at the tea party recently. This was definitely something that needed to be discussed and Reinhardt ordered Mark to leave them alone. Wilhelm had asked if it would be alright for Reinhardt to be alone with a man late at night, because others might find it a reason to reproach her. But even before that, the others had always found reasons to reproach her, so she didn't think it was important. Besides, the others already thought she and Wilhelm were in a relationship. The knight looked surprised. But Reinhardt didn't care what other people did as long as her own conscience was clear. She had raised Wilhelm since he couldn't speak, so to her he was more like a capricious child than a man. Wilhelm stiffened, ashamed, and Marka, chuckling, left the room. Rafa Reinhardt was about to speak about the worrying question when the knight suddenly gently pushed the girl on the bed, hovering over her, and seriously said that the child in his face had already grown up. Reinhardt pretended not to take the hint and apologized for joking about it in front of Marka, for she too had once been embarrassed every time her father called her an apple pie. But Wilhelm reminded her that the difference between them was only eight years. However, the girl stubbornly refused to talk on the subject. Instead, she asked him how he knew about the blood ties. Suddenly, Wilhelm closed her mouth. 
with words to the effect that children didn't like overly nosy parents. The knight left the room. The girl followed his back with a glance. Reinhardt thought the reason for this crush was the fact that she was the only woman he knew. But Wilhelm was her only card, and she could not bind him to her with something so abstract. Love, in her opinion, is quite transient and fleeting. Wilhelm at this time was thinking with annoyance that he should not have confessed then. He was suddenly called out by a woman with a sword, beside whom Dulcinea stood and looked at the knight with a blush on her cheeks. Dulcinea recognized this knight who had arrived with the head of Rudin, while the lady gazed admiringly at him. Celia demanded that the man observe etiquette, for before him was the crown prince's wife. William did indeed kneel and introduced himself, bowing in a bow. Celia hurriedly chased him away, though the knight spoke in his defense that he had been put here, and then where could he go from here? The woman was clearly outraged by the stranger's insolent behavior, but Dulcinea hastened to reassure her that the knight might not know the intricacies of the palace since he had arrived recently. William agreed, and the Princess of Canaria was mortified that such an insolent man would kneel before her. However, Kilia still resented the knight's behavior. Dulcinea told her to stop and then turned to William. This place was close to the palace where she lived, so this was also where the prince's wife walked. For the sake of his majesty's precious guest, Dulcinea was ready to leave today, but from now on she asked him to leave this garden for her, as it was her only pleasure. At this, the girl's heart beat hard, and often from the excitement caused by the man, who finally raised his head, indicating that he understood her mistress's wishes. At this, Dulcinea and Celia moved away. The prince's wife was so embarrassed that even her neck and back were blushing. When they had gone a few steps away, Dulcinea unclenched her fingers and threw her handkerchief on the grass. Wilhelm picked it up and looked at Dulcinea, who was blushing terribly. Two days later, on the day of the banquet, the preparations were already over. The Knights of Rudin had changed into their ceremonial clothes. Only Reinhardt was left to put on the prepared robes. But Lord Rudena refused to change her attire and instead ordered Glencia's adjutant to be summoned. Alzen appeared with a broad smile on his face, but when he heard that their conversation would not involve Emeralis, he immediately looked sour. Reinhardt handed him a note with personal information about the man she was looking for. Since Alzen was not going to attend the banquet, the girl asked him to rest and find this person in the capital. The adjutant's face so-and-so demanded at least some explanation, but the man Reinhardt needed was just in the capital, and he should definitely be brought. In a past life, the man had been capable of single-handedly ruling Helka. Mrs. Sarah was of age and had no experience in managing a large territory. And this man was a skilled professional, which Reinhardt had asked Alzen to track down so that Rudin could strengthen himself. Alzen had nowhere to go, but he immediately warned that he would report everything to the Margrave of Glencia, since the adjutant was his subordinate after all. That was exactly what Reinhardt wanted. She wanted the Margrave to consider her competent. Even without Wilhelm, he must believe that Rudin is strong. By the way, Wilhelm had never shown his face to her since the day he left Reinhardt's room. But she decided to leave the knight alone as he would need time to get his thoughts in order. But if he changes his mind and leaves, even without him, Reinhardt must prepare herself so that the case will not fail because this is her revenge. The girl regretted that at a time like this there was no one around whom she could safely confide. Involuntarily, she remembered Dietrich. What would he say? Reinhardt quietly said his name aloud, which could not help but hear Wilhelm standing behind the ajar door. At that moment, Wilhelm remembered many things about Dietrich. Their first meeting, his bravado about Reinhardt's sympathy, his courteousness toward Rain that made him jealous, and the way Reinhardt had first rushed not to Wilhelm's arms, but to Ernst's coffin. The knight gritted his teeth in anger. In the same mood, he walked into the room. When Reinhardt tried to find out the reason for his absence the previous two days, Wilhelm interrupted her, demanding to know why she was meeting with Fernick's adjutant. In that meeting, Marka and even the knights of the guard were escorted out of the room. In doing so, 
the head of Rudin was left without anyone's protection. But Reinhardt interrupted him with a sharp question about whether Wilhelm was her lord. The knight was taken aback, immediately apologizing. The girl, however, told him to close the door. She then asked him to tell her right away if Wilhelm wanted to become a prince. Then Reinhardt would gladly address him as your highness except that the crown prince is no longer Mrs. Rinke's husband, and from the moment she addresses Wilhelm by title, he will no longer be able to become her family or anything else. The knight protested. After all, he wasn't doing all this to be called a prince. He ended up apologizing to Reinhardt. Wilhelm handed her a jewelry box for the banquet, but the girl thought this was not the right time to talk about jewelry. She decided to talk about something really important, Reinhardt assumed that Wilhelm was avoiding her because she had rejected his confession. However, she needed him for the sake of getting revenge on Michelle Alangse. She shared that she had spent a lot of time alone, implying her past life. And now Reinhardt admitted that she didn't trust Wilhelm. He'd been hiding his secret, but he told her he loved her. For the sake of winning her heart behaved naughty. In the girl's opinion, the knight could not say that he cared for her by acting this way. Coming to the capital was not part of the plan. Reinhardt was gradually laying the foundation, was going to wait until Michelle ascended the throne, but because of Wilhelm, the plan was ruined. The knight, on the other hand, parried the fact that Reinhardt never thought of giving him her heart. No matter how hard he tried, she wouldn't give the place beside her, because Wilhelm was just a tool that couldn't do anything to her. To this, Reinhardt icily stated that Wilhelm didn't love her, he just wanted to get his hands on a toy he didn't have. To be fair, it wasn't that hard for Reinhardt to accept that love. She demonstrated it by pushing Wilhelm onto the bed, sitting on top of him, unbuttoning first the knight's shirt and then her own dress under Wilhelm's stunned and somewhat even frightened gaze. Like all these people around her said, Reinhardt could, if need be, intertwine their bodies with Wilhelm's every day. He was the only weapon she had left. And if Wilhelm wanted to get Reinhardt, he had better get her right now. In return, the girl would give him nothing but her body. Wilhelm couldn't get a word out. He was shaking with excitement and blushing desperately, looking at the half-naked Reinhardt, who was waiting for his decision. If the bread beast bared its fangs at its master, Reinhardt would only tighten the collar around its neck more so she leaned toward Wilhelm, touching his cheek affectionately. The girl was giving him a choice, either engage with her or leave things as they had been until now. Wilhelm was silent for a moment, then asked if Reinhardt could love him back when her debilitating revenge was over. At that, his palm moved up the girl's thigh. But then he sat up abruptly. Wilhelm began to adjust Reinhardt's clothes, saying that by pushing her away now, he would thereby give her a firm assurance of the truth of his love. He was willing to do anything to get Reinhardt completely, even if it was something that would push her away. The girl blushed slightly. This feeling that had arisen in her, though it was similar to what it had been when she had been caught by Dietrich as a child, or when she had been with her ex-husband, but it was completely different. New, it seems. They really can't go back in time, as Dulcinea was washing her husband's foot again, the prince's mother, Empress Castria, appeared in their bedroom. She pushed Dulcinea away, sitting down next to Michelle, and immediately asked how he was feeling. The woman had come because she had heard how her son was having a hard time right now because of Reinhardt Rinke's arrival. She convinced the prince not to worry too much about her, as he is the emperor's only seed. And no matter how these brutes flounder, Michelle would eventually become emperor. The Empress wanted to slit their throats too, but she preferred to wait a bit and play around once they were in their hands. And for that, she asked her son to wait a little longer, because when he became Emperor, he would be able to show these two hell. Suddenly, there was a quiet clinking of glass. The Empress looked angrily at Dulcinea, who was cleaning up the shards, calling her useless out loud. The girl clutched her dress with her wounded palm. But no matter who was going through what horrible time, the time of reunion had come. Even those who mocked Reinhardt from afar struggled at the banquet to say hello to her. Thus began the knighting ceremony. When the Empress saw Wilhelm kneeling, 
She felt a sense of deja vu, as if she had seen this man somewhere before. But the emperor called the name of the new knight, Wilhelm Halona, and the woman fell into a stupor. She remembered how she had ordered the Holland family to be burned when she learned that an inferior noblewoman in the periphery had dared to conceive a child with the emperor. The empress staggered with shock and fell on her son's chest, unable to understand how the emperor could do such a thing to them. She asked this aloud as well, while Michael understood nothing. His majesty said nothing in reply. The empress, on the other hand, wailed. When Michael asked her why her mother had reacted so violently, she said that Helona was the surname of a woman who had once been the emperor's lover, Dulcinea, who had also heard her mother-in-law's words, looked in surprise at Wilhelm, who turned out to be his majesty's illegitimate son. In the middle of the banquet, Reinhardt and her knight were called to the balcony by his majesty. The emperor asked who had given the name Wilhelm to his son. Without blinking, Reinhardt lied that the biological mother had done it. The girl lied because the emperor was immersed in longing and memories. What was the ruler's heartache when Michel remained his only blood? And what comfort and joy did he receive when, like a miracle, Wilhelm appeared? Wilhelm appeared. Reinhardt was merely raising the price of the goods offered for bargain. So Wilhelm's existence had to be a bit dramatized for the emperor. His majesty turned around over his shoulder. He indicated that he was aware of Reinhardt's special connection between the road-born Reinhardt and her adoptive father, and knew that the hatred for his death was something she couldn't forget even years later. And next, the emperor asked what he was leading up to. If just Michael's foot was enough for Reinhardt to hate. The girl firmly answered no. To do otherwise would simply be impossible. The only reason she lived a second time. Reinhardt had asked for Michelle Alanxi's life to be given to her. The Emperor smiled. There are some things that don't factor in. His Majesty had not one, but two sons. One is the lame son of the woman who killed the one the Emperor loved. And there is another Alanxis, the Empire itself. And for the sake of his son, the Empire man is willing to do anything. The Emperor hated Reinhardt, but she brought him a prince instead of Michelle. So his majesty was going to happily rise to the occasion, even knowing he was being used. He would give Reinhardt everything she craved, give up the crown prince's life and become a dancing puppet on a stage the girl would create. But in return, when the time comes, Reinhardt will have to wear the crown of a princess. Hearing this, both Reinhardt and Wilhelm froze. The blushing Wilhelm looked especially stunned and the head of Rudin didn't hold back, letting out a questioning cry of what? Reinhardt was angry at the cunning old man who had used the rumor that Wilhelm and her were related. The great lands Rudin had created in such a short period of time were certainly astounding, but these were the achievements of Rudin's thunder Wilhelm. Wilhelm, not Reinhardt's. And the emperor seemed to be wondering what the reason was for the knight giving all of himself to Rudin. What was the reason for such devotion? And apparently, just at that time, the Emperor heard rumors of their connection. With the question asked earlier, he ascertained whether it was true or false. Wilhelm's reaction was all too readable. The same is showing the Emperor his weak spot. If Reinhardt becomes the crown princess, Rudin will eventually pass to the Imperial family. Besides, His Majesty didn't say crown princess, just princess. So here, Wilhelm is not yet considered the crown prince. Reinhardt told Wilhelm to summon Alzen, however, the latter did not budge. He said that the adjutant had not returned yet, and Reinhardt was not going to meet a strange man in the most decent way. Is that any way for a woman who is to be Wilhelm's wife to behave? Reinhardt snorted, noting that the joke was unfortunate since Wilhelm was the only one who looked at her that way. The knight, on the contrary, thought it strange that he would not look at a girl in the bathroom with wet clothes. Reinhardt demanded not to embarrass her anymore and dragged her to the bathroom, where she wanted to wash her feet and then go to sleep. Wilhelm volunteered to wash Reinhardt's feet. He did it carefully and thoughtfully. When the girl became indignant, slightly embarrassed, at the next pressure, Wilhelm calmed her down, saying he wouldn't do anything without her consent. When he was done, 
He kissed Reinhardt's knee. The girl was simply speechless. The knight had just said something about consent, and now he was doing something like this. But Wilhelm perceived this gesture more like worshipping a goddess. In the end, Reinhardt changed the topic to a more pressing one. She asked Wilhelm's opinion of the Emperor's proposal. The knight called it magnificent. Reinhardt immediately began to convince him that the Emperor, an old fox, was playing with the word prince without adding hereditary, and would play around until he was sure that Wilhelm was better than Michelle. She also advised not to believe everything His Majesty said. The man was watching and testing everyone around him. She would have continued on if Wilhelm hadn't lifted her abruptly in his arms and carried her to the bed. Wishing her to the bed, wishing her to rest, he left the room. Reinhardt covered her eyes. She was actually worried. Although Wilhelm had spoken of the Emperor's offer in a positive way, but how he had actually taken it was unclear. Indeed, Wilhelm, who went out into the garden, looked gloomier than a cloud. He couldn't stand the fact that the Emperor was treating Reinhardt like a bargaining tool. When she smiled sincerely, a dimple appeared on her left cheek. Reinhardt had never smiled like that to Wilhelm. This smile she showed only next to one man, Dietrich. And Wilhelm only wanted the girl to show that smile to him. He wanted her to be all his, and never wanted what others gave. So the Emperor was misleading Reinhardt. Surely he must wish he could have killed her like he had in the past. Michael's screams echoed through the garden, followed by the worried maids and Dulcinea running after him. His wife tried to lead the prince back to his chambers, but Michelle roughly pushed her to the ground, calling her a useless wench who had followed him to disturb and make noise. He promised to kill her if she stopped him one more time. Dulcinea muttered an apology, and the prince turned away in annoyance. But only Michelle looked the other way as Wilhelm helped Dulcinea to her feet. The crown prince was beyond furious, outraged that Wilhelm had dared to touch his wife, for only he had the right to touch her. The knight apologized without much enthusiasm, explaining his behavior by his ignorance of the mores of the Norse of the Northeast. However, Michelle, remembering the origin of Wilhelm, took it as a deliberate desire to humiliate him. The mere memory of that event during the banquet made the prince grit his teeth. He raised his sword, intending to kill Wilhelm, but the latter intercepted his arm and took him aside. Michael couldn't resist him because he was weaker. The enraged crown prince threatened to kill Wilhelm, but the latter, almost playfully, pushed him into the grass with a precise blow to the base of his neck. Dulcinea covered her mouth with her palms in horror. Michael fell unconsciously into the grass. William lifted him up and handed him to the maids. He apologized to Dulcinea for his tactlessness and explained that he wanted to prevent a worse accident. Since Michel was drunk, he advised his wife to tell him that the prince was only dreaming. Dulcinea blushed and faded her eyes. She noted that Wilhelm's actions were indeed cruel, but his life was also in danger, so the girl would believe him. The knight thanked her for her concern, and Dulcinea aghast, blushed even more and, clutching her head, hurried away with the maids. Wilhelm followed their backs with a glance. Michelle to him was a piece of trash who had lost the remaining drop of dignity at the banquet yesterday, and the thought that such a scumbag was in bed with Reinhardt infuriated Wilhelm and fueled his desire to destroy the prince, to kill him and tear him to pieces. Dulcinea suddenly turned to Wilhelm, smiling shyly at him, and the knight thought of something that still hadn't changed. Across from Reinhardt sat Hayes Elter. This was the man that Reinhardt had tasked Alzen to find. In the girl's previous life, he was in charge of the financial affairs of the Helka estate. Then he got to those lands by pure chance, but in this life, a lot has changed. So for him, Reinhardt is now a complete stranger. Faze Elter was the second son of Baron Elter, and at the moment he worked as a petty official in the financial department. Reinhardt was sure that being the second son, he would not inherit his family. And Hayes didn't get much recognition at his current job, and since that was the case, Reinhardt, the head of the Six United Lands, offered him to become responsible for the finances of Rudin. Of course, the girl, voicing the offer, added that Elzin was recommended to her by an acquaintance, 
and she promised to reveal the name of this acquaintance only if Hayes agreed. Elter tried to refuse, but Reinhardt did not give him a chance, making it clear that she was well aware of all the compromising details of his work, including the fact that last year, Hayes was engaged in tax evasion on behalf of his superiors in the east of the country. This information, in fact, Hayes revealed to Reinhardt himself, but in a past life. Though Hayes didn't show it, he was always unhappy with his position in the finance department. And that face of his desperately trying to hold back a smile. How happy was the man who had been unrecognized for his hard work throughout his life and was an outcast when the great lord recognized his true worth. And now Reinhardt was offering to give him more of everything he wanted. She was asking to work for her for five years. After that, the girl promised him the opportunity to go wherever he wanted, and no one would stop him in doing so. And in the end, Hayes agreed. Now, Reinhardt had the best financial officer in the entire empire working for her. It was whispered in the palace that the crown princess had refused to eat breakfast and had not eaten dinner the previous night. Another maid suggested toxemia, but they laughed it off, thinking that such a thing was impossible after such a night. Dulcinea was distressed by the gossip around her and the crown prince's behavior. Fortunately, he did not remember what had happened last night. Michael thought that he had a dream in which he himself, in alcoholic intoxication, went to the welcoming palace and Wilhelm threw at him, showering profanity as if he came from the bottom. Dulcinea was silent then, but what life at the bottom could talk about if the one who scolded was Michael himself? Dulcinea staggered back as she felt dizzy. Skipping meals was taking its toll. She decided to rest in the gazebo for a while, but the longer she walked, the weaker her body became and her legs felt like cotton. When Dulcinea finally stumbled and began to tumble forward, she fell not on the grass but on Wilhelm, who was supporting her. She had never expected to see him in the crown prince's palace, so she tried to reason with him, reminding him not to just walk in here without permission. Wilhelm replied that he had come just in case and supposedly had not even thought of meeting Dulcinea. The girl looked at him confused. The knight handed her a handkerchief, which she dropped in a flurry of emotion. Dulcinea gratefully accepted it and pressed it to her breast. Wilhelm suddenly bent down to her leg and touched her bare ankle. Dulcinea immediately jumped up, find Wilhelm's actions provocative. The knight, however, explained it as mere concern for the girl might have been hurt. He also volunteered to escort the crown princess inside to help if her condition suddenly worsened, and held out his hand to her. Dulcinea looked at his palm in embarrassment, thinking that she wanted to be with this man for a little longer, but she never accepted his offer. Wilhelm, on the other hand, didn't just fall behind. He saw that Dulcinea seemed to sway before she fell, and was eager to at least simply call for a maid to lead his mistress under her arm. The crown princess reacted overly emotionally to this suggestion. She desperately did not want to walk next to the maids, who were already discussing her behind her eyes. So, not to look too bad in Wilhelm's eyes because of her violent reaction, she corrected herself by accepting the man's help. She hugged his arm, assuring him that she was not that weak and could walk on her own and that it was good to have a companion when walking. Wilhelm worried that rumors might have started, but Dulcinea didn't care anymore. She was already constantly being discussed in a bad light, even when she had done nothing wrong. Wilhelm, barely hearing this, remembered Reinhardt, who had said exactly the same thing. Then, in his past life, the knight had felt sorry for Dulcinea, but later the same woman had slapped Wilhelm with a loud shriek for the fact that people began to wash her bones because of him, called him mean and petty. She shook him by the chest and told him to know his place. So now, as they walked through the garden together, Wilhelm was disgusted. These clear memories were disgusting to him. His beloved Reinhardt had always seemed shrewd, but that was far from the case. A person who acted like she was ready to rip someone to shreds, even though she wasn't really capable of it. The one who became a warm escape for Wilhelm. She is such that even if someone were to cast out Dulcinea naked, instead of tearing out her eyes, she would take off her cloak and cover her, 
Therefore, in order not to soil Reinhardt's noble hands, Wilhelm was going to blacken himself by being nothing more than a mere despicable body. Dulcinea reached for Wilhelm, covering her eyes, but not feeling anything. She looked at him confused. The knight covered his mouth, never kissing the crown princess. He turned around, apologized, and headed away, saying that Dulcinea could wander in the crown prince's garden by herself. The girl rushed after him, wanting to stop him, but ran her gaze over a glove lying in the grass, which she picked up. To Dulcinea, William now looked like a shy man who couldn't even kiss her. This time, he wanted Dulcinea to come to him herself. As promised by the Emperor, Reinhardt was returned the title of Marquess. However, the girl failed to return the manor and estate of Rinke, which had been paid to the Crown Prince as compensation. Therefore, Reinhardt was only able to move her father's coffin to Rudin with the help of the Crystal Gate. The lords near Rudin were wondering if they were going to annex their domains as well. So one by one, they sent gifts to Reinhardt at the palace. Reinhardt was admired for how quickly she received the title of Great Lord, but the girl attributed all the credit to Wilhelm. The knight, deliberately indifferent, remarked that he was only doing his best to be a good servant, but whatever jewels he presented to his mistress, she remained indifferent to them. Reinhardt laughed nervously. It seems Wilhelm was still scrolling through the fact that she had put aside the jewelry he brought for the banquet. So later, the Lord directly asked if Wilhelm was upset when she threw those jewelry away. The knight naturally denied it, but Reinhardt could see by the look in his eyes that he was being sly with his answer. Anyone would take offense to that. It was as if the knight was turning into a small child when something like this happened. Then Reinhardt acted decisively rejecting Wilhelm's selfishness. Not that the girl wasn't sorry. She had deliberately hurt him. But Reinhardt believed. Someday there would be no room for her in Wilhelm's heart, and she would surely accept with a smile the jewels and sincerity that he had given her. A week later, the Emperor summoned them to his presence again. It was a different personal and secret summons from the last time. Wilhelm was presented with an amaryllis plague, which is only available to members of the Imperial family. When Wilhelm accepted the plaque, he didn't even look at it, only quickly tucked it away in his pocket. After noticing this, the Emperor smirked and beckoned for them to follow him. Reinhardt's gaze fell on the portrait of Delphine Alanquis, the first Empress of Amaryllis. This painting that was here was a gift from one of the Empress's lovers, but there was no official portrait of this free-spirited and busy woman. If she was that busy, would she joke about having lived nine lives already? Reinhardt looked at the portrait long and thoughtful. Did the Empress have time to write books? Ruins of the Cold Lands? Was this book really written by the first Empress? Reinhardt's attention was drawn to the ring on the Empress's index finger. It seemed familiar to her, as if she had seen it somewhere before. The Emperor and Wilhelm distracted Reinhardt from contemplating the painting. His Majesty expressed his joy that his ancestors' cherished wish of exterminating the barbarians was being fulfilled. But the First Empress had another wish besides that. The Dragon of the Frame Mountain Range. It was believed that the Ice Dragon slept in the Fram Mountains, which are covered with ice and no human can set foot there. The Empress wanted to cross the Fram Mountains much more than to find out if the dragon really existed. After all, no one knew what was on the other side of the mountain range, and even shortly before her death, the Empress had joked that she would meet her death in the Fram Mountains. The Emperor led them to the place where the portraits of the Imperial family of this era were located. They were exactly as Reinhardt remembered them. Her own had long since been burned, but there were still no pictures of Dulcinea. It was likely that the Imperial family had never accepted her. The Emperor remarked with a smile that the artist would have to try harder soon. As another person's portrait needed to be added urgently, Reinhardt looked at His Majesty questioningly. Was he really going to hang William's portrait before Dulcinea's portrait? In fact, there was no objective reason to refuse such a kind offer. But suddenly Wilhelm asked where Mrs. Reinhardt's portrait was. The Emperor turned to his son in surprise. He asked again. Reinhardt hastened to correct the situation. 
explaining Wilhelm's question by explaining that Rudin was a distant place and there was no portrait there yet. Even though she was the great head of the lands, at least one painting should be there. Therefore, if her past portrait survived, she would like to take it with her. The Emperor promised to introduce Reinhardt to a good artist. Already alone behind closed doors, Reinhardt demanded an explanation from Wilhelm for his rash words. After all, there simply could not hang a portrait of a woman who had committed a heinous crime. Wilhelm apologized, bowing his head, and the girl told him to be careful. The Emperor thought his son was out of his mind. At the moment, the throne of the Crown Prince was occupied by a man who had made a foolish choice and was blinded by love. Wilhelm had to show that he wasn't like that. One of the reasons the Emperor welcomed his appearance was exactly that. Reinhardt sighed, but turned the topic to the great religious gathering that was to be held in three weeks. This event was held every three years, a celebration that entailed believers and several gods coming to the capital and reciting prayers for several days. It was considered a really large-scale event, which brought together aristocrats and priests from all over the empire. The fact that the emperor himself had invited them to such a grand event. Reinhardt was about to reveal the truth that Wilhelm was his majesty's son. She would use the knight to declare war on Michael. If you want to ascend the throne, conquer it yourself is what Reinhardt wanted to say to her ex-husband. In three weeks' time, the war for the throne was to begin at the great religious assembly, and they would deprive Michelle Alenkis of his place as emperor. Reinhardt asked Wilhelm with a smile on her face if he was willing to watch Michelle Alenki squirm in pain and shame. Wilhelm involuntarily opened his eyes wide. He remembered how sweet Reinhardt had been when she had given him the name, and then how creepy she had been when she had demanded that he take Michelle Alenki's life with his father's blade. He remembered embracing her, remembered Michael's face, twisted with anger, as he lunged at Wilhelm with the intent to kill. He remembered Dulcinea clinging to his arm. Wilhelm knelt before Reinhardt and kissed her hand, expressing his willingness. The knight left Reinhardt's rooms. If she asked him if he could do this, he would have no choice but to say yes. If Reinhardt orders him to prepare, Wilhelm will do so. If he told him to win, he would. Everything he's done has been for her, because... Wilhelm approached the warehouse that belonged to the Imperial family. He showed the Amarilli sign to the guard who wouldn't let him in and walked inside unhindered. The knight approached the painting and pulled the cloth off of it. From the portrait, not Wilhelm was looking down at the young Reinhardt. He collapsed to his knees in front of the painting and then pressed his lips to it. Wilhelm does everything for Reinhardt because she is his goddess, his salvation. Wilhelm shook in a cold sweat. Reinhardt was sunshine. Reinhardt walked under Wilhelm's arm, chatting on a distracted topic. The knight wanted to ask her about her schedule, but the girl suddenly interrupted him without finishing because she greeted Hayes Elter, glowing with happiness. Reinhardt and Hayes immediately got into a conversation about Elter leaving the finance department. He was asked the reason, but he could not open his mouth. He was uncomfortable with simply and directly saying that he was abruptly leaving to join Rudin because he was still worried about the suddenness of what had happened. Reinhardt had convinced him that there was nothing to worry about, and if Hayes was still worried, she offered to say that they were dating her. Wilhelm was grimly silent and clearly unpleasantly surprised by Reinhardt's words. The memory of his conversation with Dietrich, when he had discussed the legend of Aludiki and Halsey with his mentor as a child, froze in front of his eyes. Ernst had tried to explain that things worked very differently in love than his mentor had imagined. Dietrich eventually said that Wilhelm would figure it out for himself when he got older. Now Wilhelm looked at Hayes and his insides swooned. Hayes reminded him of Dietrich, the same brown hair, green eyes. Reinhardt beckoned to the frozen knight, introducing Elther as Rudin's new financial manager. When Wilhelm and Reinhardt were alone together again, the knight asked where she had brought the man from. The girl evasively remarked that an employee had played along. A man who had tons of free time. And that was who Reinhardt was going to meet with, Alzen Schuttgau. When they met, Reinhardt showed him the authentic proof of Wilhelm's lineage. 
the Amerilis Tablet. Alzen also gave Reinhardt a letter from Fernick, who was returning to the capital under the pretext of visiting the church. But in reality, the heir to the lands of Glencia wanted to see the Amaryllis tablet in person. The Marquis of Glencia was concerned about Rudin's actions. Of the two princes, Glencia was completely on William's side. There were quite a few aristocrats who had animosity towards Michel. Glencia would gather them all, and in the upcoming battle for the throne, they would oppose him. And the stage for this battle will be the great church. Reinhardt told Wilhelm of the events to come. The church will be visited by the highest aristocrats with great military power. The emperor intends to draw the great lords into the battle for the throne. A war will begin, led by Wilhelm. Then, even if he dies, the emperor will not care. Because even if Wilhelm dies, his majesty will still have a crown prince. But on the other hand, if Michel dies, Wilhelm will remain and then he would become the undisputed heir with the support of both sides. Reinhardt thought the emperor was a crazy bastard. No matter what throne was at stake, but to personally send his child to the battlefield. The girl couldn't figure out if Wilhelm really didn't mind. The knight, however, not only did not object, he was even grateful for the opportunity to cut off Michael's head and present it to Reinhardt. With these words, he brought the grape he had peeled to the girl's lips and pushed through, then licked his fingers. True, it was Michelle who should die in the struggle for the Emperor's throne, but it was Reinhardt, not Wilhelm, who should stab him in the neck. And the knight himself is now in a position to kneel down in front of her and kiss her feet. Wilhelm wanted to latch onto those words, but Reinhardt told him to leave, and as he walked away, Dietrich's words about love being more complicated and confusing came back to him. And now Wilhelm thought that if it came to love, he understood much more than Ernst. Reinhardt walked with Wilhelm. The knight suddenly threw a cloak over her shoulders. Suddenly, a man's voice said that he was sure they were close. Wilhelm immediately drew his sword from its sheath. Eric Mayer appeared before them. The son of Father Reinhardt's cousin, he was the one who had stolen the money and escaped after the girl had attacked Michael and ended up in prison, and Reinhardt had no intention of listening to him. She demanded the return of her father's body because it had been missing for three days. A messenger arrived from Madame Sarah. When the coffin was unloaded from the carriage that arrived at Rudin, strangely enough, the woman did not hear the noise. If there had been a body there, there should have been some sound, just in case they decided to open the coffin. And it turned out that they had been deceived. The coffin was empty. However, they checked everything thoroughly before the shipment and found no problems. The theft happened after that. Reinhardt even fainted from the shock. She was feverish in order to find the body at all costs. At that moment, Wilhelm came in with a letter lying in front of the door. It stated that the body of the Marquis of Rinke was to be returned at dawn to the cemetery where he had been buried before. Only one knight was required to come, accompanied by one knight. Reinhardt barely read it, setting off for the meeting place. The choice of this quiet, dark cemetery was obviously dictated by the fact that even if someone died, no one would notice. And Reinhardt knew that the Empress had ordered Eric to steal the body even though the man had made excuses and said that he should be the head of Rinke because he was much closer to the Marquis than the adopted daughter. And while Eric was arguing, trying to convince Reinhardt of the independence of his actions, one of the men accompanying the man drew his sword and slashed with it. The nobleman slumped forward, and Wilhelm, who had been shielding the lady, suddenly picked her up in his arms and rushed away with her. He ran to a secluded spot and lowered Reinhardt into the grass, while he drew his sword again and asked her not to go anywhere. Wilhelm fought the Empress's men, whom she had assigned to the dead Eric, and Reinhardt finally saw what Wilhelm was like on the battlefield. Rudin's thunder. The knight who turned to her suddenly rounded his eyes and cried out. The silhouette of an assassin peered next to Reinhardt and struck a lightning-fast blow, splitting the girl's skin. Wilhelm immediately flew to the attacker and killed him with one precise blow, and then picked up the gradually settling on the floor completely confused Reinhardt. She could smell the blood. 
she could smell the desperate rage of Wilhelm, who was frightened to death by Reinhardt's wound. The girl calmed him down, and then hugged him around the neck and asked him to carry her to the horse, as she didn't think she could walk on her own right now. At the noise came the guardsman who, seeing the Marquise's condition, took over everything else so that Reinhardt could be helped as soon as possible. And they rode one horse for help. Reinhardt sat up front in William's arms and wondered why in his arms she remembered Will Holland from her past life. He had said then that they were returning from the destruction of the barbarians in the great territory of Southern Lenbo. The first impression Will had made on Reinhardt was huge, much larger and bolder than the current Wilhelm. She regarded him with caution. He, on the other hand, was quite straightforward and courteous. Reinhardt didn't remember how it happened, but at some point they talked about Michelle. She had made a mistake that day. It was about them being used as tools. Both Will, who had been on the front lines for over a decade, and the former crown princess. But Reinhardt didn't think people were tools. She had then called Michael a bastard altogether. Wilhelm lambasted her, saying she had too much to drink. And seeing him off, Reinhardt thought what a fool the other prince was. If she were him, she would have chopped Michael up long ago. In that case, the crown could have belonged to Will, and not case the crown could have belonged to Will and not to that bastard. But Will knew perfectly well that he was being used. All he knew was to fight forever. And Reinhardt desperately wanted to be in Will's shoes to do things differently. Reinhardt woke up in the palace. Marco was immediately wailing, wondering where her mistress had gotten hurt like that. Reinhardt cut off the flow and asked about Wilhelm, who had brought her to the palace. But Marka suddenly became quiet and lowered her eyes, alarming her mistress. It turned out that Wilhelm was currently torturing the assassins who had attacked them. This news made Reinhardt depressed, for she was the one who had raised such a man. Dietrich had once told her that she should treat people like chess pieces. It was only now that the girl realized the meaning of those words. She was not allowed to show affection for a piece. If she was going to use Wilhelm, she shouldn't have let him get so close to her. As for Reinhardt herself, no matter how much she regretted it, she still continued to use him in cold blood. When Wilhelm wanted love, Rank set her sights on him. But if you only water a flower whenever you want, eventually the plant will just wither away. Not to mention how a person would feel if you did that to them. Even if Reinhardt was lucky and Wilhelm didn't wither away, it didn't mean that it had grown properly. On the other hand, it wasn't too late to fix things. If the Lord had broken him, it was up to her to take responsibility. She told March to bring Wilhelm to her now. Adele sees in her. The knight appeared with blood stains on his dark shirt as if nothing had happened. Reinhardt frowned and invited him to sit down beside her on the bed. But he shook his head and decided to listen to the lady standing up. The girl was silent for a second and then rose from her seat. For if Wilhelm did not wish to approach, she would do so herself. The knight did not appreciate the girl's impulse for she was not yet allowed to get out of bed due to her wounds. This forced him to sit on the bed with her after all, carefully supporting the wounded girl under his arm. Reinhardt suddenly asked Wilhelm how he would have grown up if she had held his hand and raised him to be a decent man. Soft, kind, considerate. On winter nights they would talk about the past covering themselves with blankets and eating corn. In spring they would look at sprouts together, and in summer they would swim in the lake. The knight was quite surprised at such words, in which it sounded like Reinhardt regretted the way she had raised him. That had been true up to a point, but it couldn't go on like this. She promised not to regret anything more and gently touching Wilhelm's face, asked him to do so as well. Reinhardt then reached up and captured the kiss on his lips, wanting him to have no regrets and feel no guilt. Now the girl would no longer build a wall between them and would no longer treat him as if he were a stranger. Wilhelm's world was already very small, only Reinhardt remained in it. And the knight had never changed. All he wanted was the love of the woman who had once sheltered and raised him. For her sake, Wilhelm would do anything so she was not to be swayed. And when he quietly asked if Reinhardt would forgive him no matter what he happened to do, the girl beckoned him into her arms, making him groan in embarrassment. Reinhardt's heart and head were on fire. It was like her body was on fire all at once. But Wilhelm broke their kiss and asked them to stop there. He couldn't touch like that on a man who had just recently been seriously hurt. Lord barely held back a smile, embarrassing the man. William took a seat at the edge of the bed and turned the topic to the return of Mrs. Rinke's father's body. 
he considered taking the oath of knighthood for the sake of it. The knight's oath was a way for a knight to change his lord himself. It included three oaths. First, to always follow your lord. Second, to obey everything your lord says. And third, you cannot touch even the tip of your lord's fingers and harm him. If William breaks this oath and kills Michael, a lot of criticism will fall on his shoulders. But if the crown prince becomes suzerain, the man will no longer be crowned emperor. If he swears an oath to Michael in church and in return asks for the return of the remains of the previous marquee, it will be difficult for the empress to refuse such a deal. It would, after all, be like giving up the right of inheritance. Reinhardt didn't understand why act so drastically. After all, if Wilhelm actually took the oaths, he would no longer be able to be her knight and would no longer be able to touch Michelle. Instead of answering, he gently laid his mistress on her back and kissed her forehead affectionately. William confessed again that he loved her and had loved her for a long time, even when the Marquise had sent him to the battlefield. But even if this woman had thrown him not to war but to hell, the feelings would remain unchanged. For this, the knight promised to bring her Michael's head, so he asked to love him. At first he had been a tool or, to be more precise, a dog that was feared, but little by little it grew into trust and pity. Now Reinhardt was reaping the fruits of her own personal cultivation. She reached up to Wilhelm's face and told him she loved him, repeating it twice. They both had a hole in their souls that could not be filled. Reinhardt's guilt towards Wilhelm and his obsession with the Marquise were the threads that connected the two wounded souls. On this day alone, they were connected. There must be a reason for it. That night, Wilhelm provoked the crown princess. He came to her in the middle of the night in the garden, responding to Dulcinea's sudden request for a meeting. The pretext was a glove that belonged to the knight and which he had lost the night Michael got drunk. The girl had invited him ostensibly only to return the item to its owner. William reached for the glove, but suddenly pulled Dulcina into his arms. Dulcina was desperately embarrassed, but had little resistance to such a daring act. Wilhelm smiled and asked her if he had really been invited to a dark corner of the garden just to return a pair of gloves. The crown princess was also dressed up in all that glittering jewelry. Dulcinea blushed thickly again and snuggled into the knight's chest. She couldn't stand the feeling in her chest any longer and asked him to kiss her. A secret meeting took place in the garden of the guest palace. At this place, Dulcinea whispered words of love to Wilhelm and after that, their secret meetings continued in different parts of the imperial palace. During one of them, Dulcina reflected on the rumors that were going around the palace. The assassins who had attacked the Marquis Renki had been tortured in a warehouse. The torture was so brutal, it was said, that the servants who cleaned the warehouse afterward vomited for days. The crown princess looked into Wilhelm's peaceful face and could not understand how such a cheerful man could have done something so horrifying. She asked the knight if he would come to the prayer meeting tomorrow. When he answered in the affirmative, Dulcina nestled against his side but he sat up almost immediately, pulling away. When asked the reason for this coldness, the man replied that the precious princess could not lie next to a brute like him. Dulcina mumbled words of her love for Wilm in confusion, but the man objected. In his opinion, it was common for an aristocrat to have fun with a knight for a while. And Dulcinea had already married the crown prince, so there was no point in being serious about the emperor's illegitimate child. The girl flapped her eyelashes in surprise, from his words, she realized that this man felt a sense of inferiority around her. The crown princess tried to convince him of the seriousness of her intentions. But Wilhelm did not just assume, he knew. This woman simply enjoyed bringing someone with a lanky's blood in him to his knees. The emperor's illegitimate son who appeared before her was the perfect candidate for that. Besides, he's a commoner knight who just wouldn't give her any trouble, so Dulcina could play with him all she wanted to her. It's just a pleasant pastime. The crown princess nestled against his shoulder, as if trying to silently change his mind, but it stirred up unpleasant memories in Wilhelm, and before he could even think, he pushed her away. Dulcina froze in surprise, and the knight hurriedly apologized for his prank. The girl decided not to emphasize it and hugged the man again. She was convinced that she loved him, not the crown prince. Nevertheless, Dulcina had the courage to admit her desire to see William kneel before her longed to see him cling to her because he loved her. But before she could fully finish her desires, the knight continued her words. The crown princess wanted to see this man standing at her feet, kissing them. Hearing the confirmation of these speculations, Wilhelm pushed the girl away from him. He spoke of how Dulcinea would never give up Michael for him. But the crown princess didn't think the man had the right to talk like that without knowing anything about her situation. After all, she was responsible for her duchy of Canaria, and the knight himself already had a mistress. 
and some rumors made it sound as if William was desperate to save this woman. There was a possibility that the rumors of their sexual relationship were also true. And that was why Dulcine was especially hurt. Because she had chosen Wilhelm, but he would never choose her. The crown princess is the one who begs for every kiss. Wilhelm parried by saying that he is the one who can never refuse that very kiss. Then he suddenly asked if Dulcinea could imagine herself in his arms under the sun, where they would be free to stand before a god. But she did not believe in such miracles, but hoped to meet him in the next life and love him without regard to commitment. But William had already lived one life, and in that life he was a prisoner of the crown princess. Dulcina took these words as empty sweet fantasies. In reality, she only had to envy Marques Renke, who had this knight as her subordinate, to the objection that Dulcinea had also taken something from Reinhardt. She angrily remarked that she did not wish that, and she only wishes for Wilhelm, with a smile. The man said that since Dulcina desires it, she should get it, just on that secret night, which not even the moon was to know about. The crown princess did not realize the meaning of those words at the time, but at the prayer meeting the next day, she finally realized the meaning of his words from the night before. The crown princess had heard from her husband that William was going to take his vows to Chevalier Adelpho. The crown prince and his mother were quite pleased with Wilhelm's decision to take the oath. They were already anticipating the benefits of it, since the knight would fall into their hands and would not dare to even try to oppose them. Dulcinea was sickened by their smug faces. Their pompousness was understandable, after all. Wilhelm was the best knight, and everyone in the empire had their eyes fixed on him right now. But the crown princess was concerned about something else. Chevalier Adelpho's oath meant that the knight, should his master die in an accident, must take responsibility for the family of the deceased. Which means that if Michael dies suddenly and his wife is left alone, William would have to take her as his wife and make himself responsible for her. And in such a context, the words, if you wish, you must have it took on a very concrete meaning. Reinhardt glanced at the scar at the nape of her neck. If she went to the prayer meeting, all eyes would be on her. That was why the Marquise questioned the need to be there. At the last moment, Reinhardt put aside her mourning veil and went out without it. In the courtyard, the Marquise encountered Wilhelm, who noticed with concern the unhealthy appearance of his mistress, but she wrote it off to the usual lack of sleep. She was still beautiful to Wilhelm even tired and with scars on her neck and cheek that had barely healed. Reinhardt found it hard to believe such words from a man who was about to take an oath of loyalty to another lord. Wilhelm reminded her that he was doing this solely to return Marquis Renke's body to his daughter, and that could only be done after the oath was taken. On the other hand, the woman worried that the Empress might not return the remains even after this procedure, and Lord Rudina would simply lose his beautiful knight in the process. Suddenly, Wilhelm stopped causing Reinhardt to look back at him in surprise. The man visibly blushed at the unexpected compliment and asked to speak again. Instead, Reinhardt took the knight's face in the palms of her hands, and, their foreheads touching, confessed her love. Wilhelm drew her sharply to him and enclosed her in his strong arms. At that moment, he didn't give a damn that they might be seen in the hallway by outsiders. He desperately wanted to prolong the happy moment longer. And Reinhardt didn't insist. She hugged him back and gave him time to just stand like that with her by his side until Wilhelm was ready to pull away on his own. At the meeting they ran into an old acquaintance, Fernach Glencia. The Marquise exchanged greetings with him, while the stares of the whispering aristocrats fixed on them, in a whisper, so as not to be heard by prying ears. Fernach asked about why it was so difficult for him to get the war loan that Lord Rudena had lent him a few years ago. In the same tone, the Marquise replied that if the debtor died there would be no one to repay the loan. The heir to Glencia then turned his attention to Reinhardt's scars, but the woman had no time to reply, for William intervened and led his mistress away. Fernacha did not interfere. The thought to himself how pointless it was to win the war at the face of this knight's lover now looked like this. Wilhelm, as usual, gave him goosebumps, and the heir to Glencia decided to go with his men to the field as well. But at the same time, the clergyman led the Marquess to the prepared place. It was located in such a way that all the nobles would be able to get a better look at Reinhardt's wounds. Also, the emperor would be sitting right in front of her. On the other hand, the other nobles wouldn't be able to get close to her even if they were uncomfortable. It looked too childish. And of course, Wilhelm noticed the displeasure on his mistress's face and offered to move. Reinhardt decided to stay in the seat the empress had prepared for her. She was even grateful to her. The empress must have thought that the Marquise would try to hide her wounds but it would be unpleasant for the head of Rudin to put a veil over her face and inhale the smell of medicine. However, 
The point was still that Reinhardt simply had no reason to hide her wounds, and she would show them to the Empress, even if she didn't want to look. Even with those wounds, the Marquise was still alive and it didn't matter what else she had to go through. The important thing was that Reinhardt had returned alive and was able to appear in front of them even in this form. Suddenly, the reflection was interrupted by an uncertain female voice that addressed the Marquise as Highness. Reinhardt was angry at first when she heard your Highness being addressed as your Highness, because only members of the Imperial family were addressed that way. But when she saw who was calling her that, her irritation faded away. In front of her stood an almost weeping Johanna. Ever since her early childhood, when Reinhardt was not yet crowned princess, she had been her personal sweet maid until the Marquess had been kicked out to Rudin. And the first thing they did was a big hug. Johanna was just happy about this meeting. Next to them awkwardly stomped the husband of the maid, Frederick Schneider, whose wedding took place shortly after the departure of Mrs. Ericola's Rinke in Rudin. Johanna's mother was an extremely strict woman, and given that the one her daughter served had been deposed from her position as crown princess, the woman had understandably decided to marry her daughter in haste before her reputation was damaged because of Reinhardt. The Marquis sent the former maid to her place so that they would not be seen together by the Empress and would not cause problems for the girl. Johanna obeyed, but insisted on another meeting. Reinhardt was also genuinely happy to meet the former maid. But firstly, her husband was clearly uncomfortable standing next to the deposed crown princess, and secondly, it could still bring their family problems because of the Empress. Wilhelm, who had been silent until then, noticed that Johanna was probably not a close friend of the lady, for she had never once traveled to Rudin in all that time. Reinhardt looked at him with confusion and decided to soften the temper of this child who still had a hard time getting along with other people. She snuggled up to him and said affectionately, but admonishingly, that sometimes you have to be soft because relationships are like water. No matter how much you cut it, you can't cut it, even if it ripples. Wilhelm, for example, could not turn away from Reinhardt as if they were strangers. If his mistress had done something bad to him, it was exactly the same with Johanna. Admittedly, the Marquis should have taught Wilhelm to be more friendly and caring. So she talked about how her departure must have been very painful for Johanna. They had once spent time together very happily, and whatever had happened, it wasn't going anywhere. That was why Reinhardt was so understanding. Their conversation was interrupted by the appearance of the Emperor and Empress. The Marquise was about to go to greet them, but she was overtaken by a sudden question from Wilhelm. He was worried whether the lady would try to understand the reason for his actions, if he suddenly did something wrong to her. Reinhardt froze in astonishment, seeing such an expression on the knight's face for the first time. Meanwhile, everyone rose from their seats to greet the monarchs. Fernach was the first to greet them and was the victim of an awkward compliment from the Empress about how pretty he was. The Marquise and her knight were next. They bowed. Wilhelm began making standard small talk with his majesty, while Reinhardt met the eyes of the disgruntled empress. Such a vicious gaze, which at this second was the ruler's, truly could kill. And all because she had already missed the opportunity to deal with Wilhelm twice. When the emperor finished with his greeting, his wife was next, but the woman arrogantly passed by without even glancing at the marquise. Mrs. Rink, on the other hand, was looming over the crown prince, smirking. He caustically remarked that Rudin's thunder must have been just a downpour, and he couldn't believe that such a faithful dog would allow his mistress to be mutilated. Reinhardt stepped forward and reminded Michael in a firm voice that the Imperial family had already taken their seats, and if the Crown Prince delayed any longer, people would really think that there was a friendship between the royal family and Rudin, and if His Highness didn't want that, he should have held back his friendliness and gone to his seat. Wilhelm admired his mistress. Michelle, on the other hand, threw it to her with disgust that Reinhardt hadn't changed a bit, though the Crown Prince himself hadn't changed much in the meantime. And next to greet His Highness was the Crown Princess, Dulcinea Canaria. There was a time when Reinhardt had asked Michael for permission to kill her. Now, on second thought, the current wife of that jerk is just a victim. Therefore, the Marquis quietly bowed for greeting, but Dulcinea ignored her and stood in front of Wilhelm and gave him a hand. Reinhardt didn't understand why Dulcinea approached Wilhelm, the knight, however, was not confused and kissed the outstretched hand with a slight smile, introducing himself. The crown princess blushed at how passionate the kiss seemed to her. She felt her heart about to jump out of her chest with excitement. But when Dulcinea's eyes fell on Reinhardt, the crown princess couldn't hold back a victorious grin. The marquise was lost in speculation about what was happening. Somehow it made her very angry. The next day, Hayes paid a visit. 
He came with a flower, as he considered it impolite to come to the lady empty-handed. Wilhelm was the first to snatch the gift and test it for poison. His lady apologized for that, but she needed to be more careful after all. Hayes understood and called the sight of the scars on Reinhardt's beautiful body a heartbreaking sight. Marquise, amused, called him a player with the lady's hearts. Hayes cheered back, but he was half-heartedly thwarted by the heavy gaze of a knight in whom he recognized William Holland. His appearance was strangely familiar. Wilhelm rudely demanded not to stare at him. Once again observing such an attitude of the knight, the Marquis tried to reconcile him with Hayes, after all, they were to see each other often. But, apparently, William still saw in this man Shadow Dietrich and therefore felt jealousy and anger. However, he continued to keep all these thoughts within himself. But he still had to tolerate Hayes, because Reinhardt decided to continue the conversation with him over a cup of tea. It was about Lord Rudin's departure. The Marquess had originally intended to leave after the prayer meeting. The Great Prayer Meeting is a lengthy event that lasts a total of seven days. Each day a prayer is held to a particular god. But the most important grand celebration is held on the last day. When the High Priest covers his head with holy water, it is believed that the original sin of blood can be washed away on that day. In other words, even if William is an illegitimate child, after this day he will be officially recognized as a member of the imperial family as soon as the holy water falls on him. After that, he intends to swear an oath to Adelpho, so Reinhardt had to see the Emperor's reaction. After Reinhardt's words that she had to delay, Hayes realized that it was probably because of the Great Festival. And then the rumors that this knight is the Emperor's illegitimate child might be true. Reinhardt also asked the man to find her mother's jewel, the Marquess of Rank. Originally, she had sold it to Lady Johanna's father, but apparently the wife sold the jewel when she was preparing a wedding dowry for her daughter. Reinhardt had needed to sell the item urgently then, but now she wished to return it. Hayes was at a bit of a loss for this request. After all, he was not working as a mercenary, but as a treasurer. Reinhardt waved him off and invited him to dinner. It was only when the man wanted to agree that he was interrupted by a grim Wilhelm. He was not happy about Hayes's company, and therefore gave all sorts of arguments to avoid having dinner with this man. The knight reasoned that it was too late, and they still wanted to visit the high priest to ask for Rudin's blessing. Of course, the clergyman was willing to do it at any other convenient time, but Wilhelm was pressured by the tightness of the schedule and the fact that supposedly this evening was the only free window. Reinhardt eventually did have to cancel the dinner with Hayes. In parting, the treasurer politely kissed the Marquise's hand, which drew the silent wrath of the knight. Hayes, frightened by Wilhelm's gloomy era, hurriedly withdrew. Each time, the man looked at the treasurer so warningly and maliciously, as if he and Reinhardt were lovers. Sure, Hayes had heard rumors of their connection, but in reality it was more like a knight's unrequited love for his mistress. On the other hand, it was strange. The treasurer remembered where he had met Wilhelm. One night, having had a few too many drinks, Hayes had snuck past the guards into the garden and accidentally stumbled upon the knight of Rudin embracing the crown princess. And if he had any feelings for the Marquise, why was he doing it? One night, encouraged by his departure from the finance department, Hayes was wandering through the galleries with a bottle of liquor and accidentally wandered into the grounds of the Crown Prince's palace. He wanted to leave the place now, but his gaze was suddenly drawn to a couple lurking in the night. Wilm Holliday and the Crown Princess were embracing away from other people's gazes in the darkest corner of the garden, and Hayes did not now realize whether he should report what he had seen to the Marquess. After all, the Crown Princess was not some servant girl to make out with so easily. But if he thought a little longer, the treasurer was very fond of his life and integrity, and William might deprive him of both after such a prank. To assuage his conscience, Hayes tried to convince himself that he had been too drunk that night and might have gotten things mixed up. More important to him now was his long-awaited departure from the capital. Stealthily, the treasurer took the letter out of his pocket and read again, the advice that the man should come to the meeting with the Marquise with flowers. It also asked whether Hayes was avoiding women because he did not understand their feelings. The treasurer pulled himself back, however, turning his attention to his plans to explore every inch of Rudin's territory upon his arrival. As Reinhardt sat in front of the mirror, Wilhelm offered to do her hair. He'd only seen it done, of course, but in any case, he could always call on Marka if he didn't like the result. The Marquise readily agreed, and the knight began with a light massage, as he had heard that servants did just that before, to relax the lady. Even if Wilhelm was not a masseur, if he were a servant to Reinhardt, he would be anything for her. And while the Marquise chuckled at his amusing words, the knight stole a light kiss from her. At his mistress's surprised look, 
William remarked that she should be more careful when she was being courted by a man. The Marquise snorted, but was not seriously offended by the insolence. The knight braided her hair, and they set off to meet the high priest. On the way, Reinhardt scolded Wilhelm. The Marquise knew he had specifically said the blessing it highs to find an excuse to cancel the dinner. After all, the only thing Mrs. Rinke needed at the temple was to make donations. The high priest didn't care about the situation in Rudin at all. All he cares about is more money, and there's always time for that. In the end, Reinhardt urged him not to do it again. She didn't really understand why the knight had become so clingy lately. She hadn't even been able to have dinner with another man because of him. She'd even been braided by Wilhelm instead of Marquis. Wilhelm pulled the Marquis tighter around his waist and leaned in to express his thoughts that it made him cute. Then he apologized for it. The mistress had been so affectionate with him lately, so the knight was greedy and wanted more. It seemed to Reinhardt at that moment as if Wilhelm's embrace had become more tenacious than before. He pressed in almost closely and his breath touched the scar, causing him to blush. Quietly, the knight indicated that he was ready to stop if the lady so desired, but the Marquise was not against it. That was what she said without turning around due to extreme embarrassment. Wilhelm felt a sense of joy, honestly. The day Reinhardt received those wounds, the knight thought he would deal with every person who had anything to do with hurting her, one step at a time, and after that Wilhelm was going to die himself, and pondered whether he should hang himself, or if he should give the Marquess the whole world first and die in battle, that day. When Reinhardt woke up and called the tutor to her, it seemed as if he was walking through hillfire and his heart was beating in a mad rhythm. He was desperately afraid to even just look at the Marquise. But after the appearance of wounds, Reinhardt, on the contrary, began to treat Wilhelm more tenderly. The man hated himself for not being able to protect her. He was bitter about the pain he had caused his beloved, but even so, Reinhardt had not abandoned him. And a tool that his master had not gotten rid of could not afford to die at his whim. However, every time Wilhelm saw those wounds, it hurt deeply, and at the same time, the knight wanted to continue to be cared for. At that moment, listening to all of this, Marquise Rinke couldn't utter a single word. She had heard it too many times to be surprised, over and over again, an infinite number of times. Wilhelm's words of love for her, he loved her more than when they first met, more than when she read him fairy tales, more than when she gave him the sword. More today than yesterday, just her alone. And Reinhardt knew how futile love was. Everyone she loved had left her. After all, this guy too, to the Marquise, it was like a deep dark shadow she could drown in. And even so, Reinhardt couldn't resist him. On the contrary, she realized that she was already up to her neck in this man and could not do without him. The Empress was seething with rage. This insolent woman, Reinhardt, had shown her ugly face in front of so many people. And what a shame it was that this woman didn't have the slightest sense of humiliation. Slide just as the Empress had planned. No one ever approached Marques Reinke throughout the prayer meeting. It wouldn't have been easy to talk to a lady with whom the ruler had a mutual hatred. And most of the aristocrats knew this. However, because of the rumors that Knight William was the Emperor's illegitimate child, the nobles looked at him with curiosity and anticipation of a fight for the throne, and the Empress shook with anger. She was certain that this bastard from Rudin would never take the throne. So their mind in complete turmoil, the Empress burst into her son's chamber, catching Dulcina fuming incense. In a burst of emotion, the woman struck the crown princess, blaming the girl and her incense for her son's headaches. The ruler also charged Dulcinea for her antics in the temple for the crown princess had dared to extend her hand unnecessarily to her illegitimate offspring. Elsinia's hands trembled with fear. No matter what she said now, the empress would still be angry with her. This woman might even cause a scandal and punish Wilhelm. In a panic, Dulcinea tried to find words while contemplating whether to just keep silent. But in the end, the crown princess decided to speak her teeth first and apologize. She explained her actions by saying that she wanted to give the high-ranking aristocrats the impression that the imperial family was harsh, and she did not wish to hurt the empress's pride at all. The woman clearly did not accept her sister-in-law's apology and slapped her again. It was funny for the empress to hear such a thing from the mouth of a wench who stole someone else's fiancé. And personally, the empress thought that someone like Canaria should never have become the crown princess and Michael's bride, as long as the honor of the imperial family was at stake. She also blamed Dulcinea for the death of Marquis Rinki, which actually caused her son's leg to suffer. This was the last straw. Michelle, who had been silent until then, snapped, forcing his mother to stop making him nervous. The crown prince felt that the illegitimate son didn't have much time left free anyway. After all, 
He was going to give him the oath of Adelpho in front of everyone. Reinhardt, on the other hand, was going to kill Michael after his own coronation. But before that, he would take certain measures for his own safety. So the bewildered empress immediately came to her senses and began to comfort her son, embracing him. Dulcina was told to go to the meeting with Priest Halsey scheduled for the afternoon. The crown princess bowed deeply, not daring to cross her husband. The empress continued to embrace her precious child and whisper something in his ear. Dulcinea turned around and took a step, then another but faster, and so on until she stopped running. She convinced herself that she would be all right and that she didn't care about these people at all. The girl ran into the garden and threw herself into Wilhelm's arms. To be honest, Dulcinea understood everything perfectly well. She knew that Michael was the crown prince and had seduced him. If only he wasn't the heir, then she wouldn't have even had the thought of sleeping with someone like this piece of shit. Dulcinea pressed herself tighter against the man, hiding her face in his shirt. She asked Wilhelm not to act in public as if he belonged to another woman, for the girl considered him hers. When asked if the knight was sure of his intentions to swear an oath to Adelpho, the man answered positively without a second thought. Dulcinea pressed herself harder. The empress was right. The princess of Canaria would take everything from Reinhardt. The first time was difficult, but the second time, it was easier. Finally lifting her face, Dulcinea promised to do everything she could to make sure Wilhelm no longer clung to his worthless mistress. She would do everything to make sure the knight was only with her. On the third day, the worshippers offered prayers to Halsey, the goddess of vengeance in the great temple. On this day, however, men are forbidden to enter Halsey's temple, for she hates them and only women are allowed to pray to the goddess. At the temple, Johanna approached Reinhardt. The excited girl decided to find out if the Marquess was really in love at the moment. Lord Rudena embarrassedly recoiled and then accelerated her step, trying to literally get away from this unpleasant topic. But Johanna continued to babble self-consciously about how she had already seen the young knight and had judged him to be a real beauty. And no matter how Reinhardt did not evade the answer, the former maid kept returning to this topic until the Marquise finally gave up and shared some of her experiences. In fact, Mrs. Rinke was not sure that all was well between her and Wilhelm. All this time, she had perceived him as a younger brother, and sometimes even as her sheltered child. Because of this, Reinhardt considered herself not a very good hostess. Besides, she thought of him as cute rather than handsome. Johanna looked at her skeptically. If a woman seemed, in her opinion, like a grown man was cute, that was pretty much the end of it. That is, Reinhardt was hopelessly in love and Johanna really wanted to be at her wedding. This teasing only angered and embarrassed the Marquise, while the former maid was very amused. Already after the service, Reinhardt was returning with Johanna. The girl noticed that this year's prayers went faster than in the past, when they had to talk to the high priest for a long time, pouring flattery on each other for more than an hour, and then give a large donation. Johanna didn't even know if it was even worth it to be a servant of the goddess Halsey, if one would end up being punished anyway. In Reinhardt's vivid imagination, the image of the majestic goddess of vengeance Halsey appeared. On the antlers of the reindeer she carried in her hands were fruits. They symbolized true sweet revenge, for true revenge must first of all be sweet. Therefore, this fruit must be just that. Tantalizingly seductive. Reinhardt will never forget what was done to her father, and will walk this path. Even if uncertainty awaits her, she will walk it, and at the end of that path she will treat all wrongdoers to this sweet fruit. In imperial mythology, there are four gods symbolizing the four seasons, all of them are known to be children of Halsey. Among them, the winter god Antu was the only child she did not give birth to. Here is the story of the goddess. Returning from Eludica, Halsey met a boy. He turned out to be Antu, the son of the man who betrayed Halsey. Although he was the son of an enemy, the goddess took pity on the abandoned child and raised him in her castle. In a fit of jealousy, Eluka deprived the land of Antu of fertility. Then, turning into Antu, he seduced Halsey by deceit and forced her to give birth to Karen, the god of summer. It's weird. It doesn't seem like it at all, but to Reinhardt, he reminded her of Wilhelm. This was a picture she had never paid attention to while she was crowned princess. The Marquise missed him. Finally, Reinhardt and Johanna said their goodbyes. The Marquise noticed the disgruntled face of her knight, who didn't even bother to say hello to his mistress's former servant. The knight remained silent for a long time until he finally admitted that Johanna was the one who knew things about Reinhardt from the past that he himself would never know. And consequently, he was terribly jealous of that. The Marquise suddenly smiled. She offered a different perspective. The time when the knight had not known Reinhardt had allowed her to meet him, 
both her marriage to Michael and his betrayal. Plus, Johanna hadn't been around when the Marquise had been attacked by the mercenary, when she was in desperate need of help. Wilhelm himself was there for her. The man was speechless with embarrassment, unable to take his eyes off the woman, and she kept talking about how Wilhelm would be able to recognize in the future the Reinhardt that no one knows. And now the true face of the Marquise was appearing before the night, one that only Wilhelm knew. These words clearly made the man happy. He kissed Reinhardt and involuntarily pressed her against the wall. At that moment, a hot and excited Wilhelm appeared before her. He was as Reinhardt had never seen him before. So, we look forward to your comments about this story. To not miss new videos. Please subscribe to notifications. Thanks for watching.